Good evening, everybody. It's Mark Cleghorn here. Welcome to the Photographer Academy. And uh, tonight we're joined by Mark Seymour, an amazing uh, documentary wedding photographer um, from London in the UK. Um, we're going to be talking to Mark, a little bit of an interview uh, with him first, and I'm going to be looking at some of his amazing images. Just um, a quickie. Uh, some of you will be aware that in the past two weeks we've changed our Facebook address now for the Photographer Academy. Of course, we were originally called Photo Training for You. Uh, we began to morph to the new name um, at the beginning of this year and now the Facebook has fully moved over to that so if you haven't done so already then please 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 go ahead and actually um, go and like the new page which is the Photographer Academy. Basically um, top tog webinars are all designed around bringing um, some of the world's uh, kind of really great photographers or those in the the news as it were uh, bringing their work to us and kind of a chance to kind of interact with them uh, in a way that perhaps we can't do on a day's workshop or seminar and so on, but many of the photographers who are going to be um, involved with the Top Talk webinars with us, they all run their workshops in some way, so kind of um, watch out for those as well. I'm the host, that's me, ugly face on the left hand side, sorry about that, and I'm the training director for the Photographer Academy. For those of you unaware of what the Photographer Academy is, we're an online training for photographers, uh, whether they're a kind of a beginner, keen amateur, going through right through to the pro. Uh, we have three levels of membership uh, academy for the kind of introduction, the kind of more basic skills. Pro is for the pro photographers or the semi-pro photographers, and then the, biz uh, the business is really for the people looking to make money out of us, and uh, or make, make money out of photography, I should say. <clears throat> so if you haven't checked out that, you can just, quick way to get to us is pt tv so that's P-T, the number four, and the letter U, dot TV with it. Uh, it's a quick way to get to us. Um, if you haven't seen our printed bro uh, brochure. Uh, it's uh, there to view at any stage on the Facebook page now, so we've kind of download, uh, downloaded it. We've got lots of things going on for the end of the year, including the uh, Academy Yearbook. We've got an online magazine that's going to be coming out as well, so watch out for all the kind of extras, and all those are free to bed. Med, uh, members of course and e even though uh, this is a free webinar with us tonight remember that we record, uh, record it for review and you'll be able to watch us again on the Photographer Academy it, it will be on free view for seven days um, from Thursday of next week um, then it will just be members only of course so check, uh, check that out remember our Facebook page is facebook.com forward slash the Photographer Academy so that's a little bit of a pre addable there, kind of getting things going. Uh, let's just check that we can hear Mark loud and clear. Mark, come on in. Hi, good evening. Good e evening to you. Remember, in some parts of the world, it's good morning, good afternoon, and everything else. <laughs> it's, it's a very strange thing to realize. Obviously, we're getting towards the end of our day, uh, but in fact, some people are just having a quick yawn and kind of rushing to their computers to uh, watch us. Well, welcome, to, uh, welcome to anyone who's uh, around the world. So good good to have you all on board. Great. So we're, we're going to be having a quick chat about your life and kind of your work and everything else. We've got lots and lots of photographs to be uh, looking at, Mark. Uh, what are we expecting during the course of the night? What are you going to be showing um, us? I'm going to be showing you um, my documentary style wedding photography, uh, mostly in black and white. Um, that just lets me sort of capture, if you like, the, sort of the essence of, of a wedding day. Um, so please sort of fire away with, uh, with lots of questions. Cool. We've got them coming in thick and fast already, so you don't need to uh, <laughs> um, prompt it. I'll be prompting during the course of the night anyway. Uh, we'll give you out Mark's um, Facebook page towards the end and so on. Remember, he's a busy working photographer, so don't hound him. Otherwise, you won't have any life at all kind of thing with it. So, uh, um, okay, let's, let's get into a little bit about you, Mark. Uh, tell us... Uh, how you first got into photography and how you ended up getting into wedding photography. Okay, um, it started uh, way, way back in uh, 1986. Um, I can remember the year because I just got married and uh, like a lot of um, young couples, we were short of cash and, and I was a photographer at the point and um, I was really an amateur photographer and I've been one since really I was sort of four or five years old, I was always playing around with cameras. Um, but I don't know why, um, that day I went into the newspaper shop and I bought a um, the Telegraph newspaper, which I never buy, and I probably haven't bought many times since. But in the back in the job pages, as, as you know, Thursday is uh, job day advertising in the Telegraph, there was a tiny little advert at the back that said, sell wedding photography. 
So it just caught my eye. I wasn't looking for a wedding photography job. It just caught my eye. It's a good way of earning some extra money, and I applied to um, to, to the company and um, went up there, saw them, and uh, they agreed to train me in the art of selling wedding photography. Uh, the company was called National Weddings, uh, who later went on to become Kodak Weddings. Uh, they really were a, a huge, huge company back in the 70s and 80s, and employing something like 300 photographers every weekend. Um, it was a very high pressure job. It was purely sales. I used to go out in the evening, um, see three appointments. If I sold, I earned money. If I didn't sell, I didn't earn money. And that continued for probably sort of, I don't know, five or six months. And I approached the sales director and I said, hey, I, you know, I'd love to learn wedding photography. I think I'm a good photographer. And he rebuffed me totally and just said, Mark, he says, everyone wants to be a wedding photographer. Even back in 86, everyone wanted to be a wedding photographer. And he said, if you really want to be one, he said, you need the right gear. And asked me what gear I had. And he said, you need to go and get a medium format camera, a Metz flash gun, and a light meter. So I went and bought that, and then he said, go and shoot 10 rolls of film. Now, as an amateur, 10 rolls of film is quite a, a task to go and shoot when you don't have subjects or you're not doing it for, for paid money. And also, it's, it's very expensive to go and get 10 rolls processed. But I did it, took them back. He liked them. They agreed to train me. And in a nutshell, that, that year in the April, when the wedding season started, they took me out. I went out six times with one of their photographers. And he phoned me up the following week and said, the colleague you've been going out with is off sick. You're doing the wedding yourself this weekend. So I had six lessons with a photographer. And then I was uh, put in the deep end. And it really was sort of bicycle clips around the bottom of the trouser time. Very, very hard. But I think my enthusiasm sort of uh, carried me through. And I stayed with National Weddings for about a year. And I decided this was going to be my career. Um, I'm a great believer in that you know, when a door opens, go through it, and opportunities will come your way. And the next thing I did is I went and borrowed £4,000 from mum and dad and took out an advert in Yellow Pages, having not shot a wedding at this point, saying Mark Seymour Photography. In fact, I tell a lie, I actually called myself Classic Weddings at that point because the Yellow Pages girl advised that I should begin with A, B, or C to be at the front of the directory. And the leads started coming in, and uh, I turned them down because I hadn't done any training. Um, but then I started getting leads for September, October, November. I thought, well, I'll start taking the inquiries, and we booked a few people. And I did a lot sort of, uh, you know, by the seat of my pants, but I was confident that it would come off. And that was the real the start of my wedding uh, photographer career. Well, brilliant. I mean, for those of you who don't know what uh, national weddings are, they, they were uh, a, obviously a national company that basically booked weddings all over Britain, and they had uh, job-in photographers who just turn up, shoot the job, and then actually give them the rolls of film, and that was it. So sorry for those who are just kind of catching up with us now. Um, Mark, before, uh, before we go on, I'm just going to ask you in a minute for some kind of funny tales, perhaps, before we start to show some of your images. And if this is the first time with you on a webinar, please, guys, remember that uh, you are going to be seeing some images in a minute. This is just giving lots of time for people to kind of join us live and things. So a little bit of an introduction before Mark shows uh, some of his amazing photography. So any kind of funny stories about couples or anything else before we get going? Yeah. The, the, I mean, I've, I've got lots of stories to tell about National Williams because we were dealing with, you know, the low end of the market and, um, you know, I was going into people's homes pretty much unannounced. Um, you know, they, they were booking calls. So they, they were expecting someone to come around, but, you know, it was a very loose appointment. You were going in effectively like a double glazing sales guy with, with an album of everyone else's photographs in, in, in a horrible velour crushed velvet album. But one story sticks out above them all is that I knocked on this um, this door in a not very desir desirable part of uh, Felton in Middlesex, 
and um, knocked on the door and dad answered the door in a, a string vest and he said who are you mate and I said uh, I'm Mark Seymour I said I work for National Weddings I've just come to see your daughter about photography and I've gone into the lounge and um, when I've walked in the lounge I've, I've sat down and the whole family are there and it's almost like a scene from I don't know Coronation Street or you know it, it, it's it's looked pretty seedy in this lounge. It's, you know, it's dirty in there. It's grimy, and it, it's quite kind of sort of pressurised as well because I'm out of my out of my comfort zone. So in this lounge, there's the TV in one corner. There's the bride and groom. There's mum and dad. Mum and dad both smoking away heavily. And then lying in the corner is is the bride's sister and her boyfriend, and they're literally getting it together. In the, in the corner, uh, and I mean getting it together. You know, they were quite heavy at it in the lounge while I'm doing my presentation, um, which is verbatim because you say the same thing on every every sort of the show. And uh, <laughs> I, I give this presentation, and the guys uh, halfway through the presentation, this cat walks across the floor. And when I say it walks across the floor, it's obviously in a lot of pain. And it, its stomach is literally sort of scraping across the floor. And the dad just looked at me and he said, he said, oh, he said, one of us screwed it earlier, don't worry. <laughs> Sorry. Is, I mean, it's like, yeah, Mark. Sorry, I forgot to mute. He didn't use the word screwed, he used another word, beginning with F. I didn't think I should use <laughs> Thanks so much for keeping it clean tonight. <laughs> And, and he just looked at me and, and I said, oh, I said, don't worry. I said, you know, I'm more into sort of sheep myself. And he burst out laughing. <laughs> uh, and he said, he says, you're our photographer. And he squared up to me at the end and he just looked me in the eye and he says, we may have had a laugh tonight, sonny boy. He said, <laughs> my daughter's wedding up. And he says, oh. You over. Shh, sorry, you must do that. Sorry, but so apologies, guys. I know it's not Channel Four, but please don't swear. <laughs> no, it's before nine o'clock. Yeah, um, please, please, please. Sorry, but yeah, but that. that's what happened. And you know, the wedding was booked. I didn't photograph it because I was just a sales guy. And you know, the rest is history. I phoned the office, told them about it, and I'm no idea what the pictures looked like because that was one of the downsides of national weddings is you never ever saw your work. So. Um, I've got a lot more funny stories, but I think you know, let's move on. Yeah, let's get looking at some Im uh, some images. Um, so we've got um, the first selection we're going to be looking at. Uh, you've chosen because they're a part of your Master Photographers Association, which is a, a group in the U uh, the UK for professional photographers. Uh, and this is a part of your qualifications panel. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about it before we start to see the images? Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd say to any photographer, you know, it won't it, um, it won't uh, grow your business by uh, getting awards, but it, it gives you self belief and it, it makes you improve, you know, in your chosen career and do the best you can because you're focusing on on certain things. So I would encourage anyone to sort of you know, go ahead and do a licensure, a fellowship, or an associateship. Um, the, there's three levels. The licensure is the lowest level, and Really, any professional photographer should be able to achieve that. It's, I would say it's relatively easy. Then there's a big jump up to associate and fellowship. And just to put it in context, I believe I'm right, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, but so far as a fellow in winning photography, there's only about 16 or 18 ever been awarded. Yeah, there's not many at all, is there? It's a very, very tough um, genre to, to, to get an, an, a, a fellowship in. There's a lot of fellows in portraiture because I guess once you reach that standard, you can recreate that in a studio environment as long as you've got the right client and the right lighting and you've got uh, ideas of about how to put images together. But with wedding photography, it's totally different because everything's an unknown on the wedding day. You know, you you don't know what's going to happen. You could have great weather. You could have uh, bad weather. You could have a good-looking bride. You could have a a you know, slightly larger bride, light might, might not be right. So there's many, many variables. And also you've got a timing factor on the wedding as well. Um, so with an associate panel with in a documentary style, um, I was trying to, to gain this, this award 
with totally unposed images. And I was pleased to say that you know when I received the award three years ago, I was the first person. I'm not sure if I'm still the only person to have received that award for documentary wedding photography. Um, I'm under a lot of pressure from the guys there to, to put together a fellowship. Um, it's very, very difficult to get a fellowship standard picture from in a documentary style and to get 20 of them. Cool. Um, let's, uh, let's get going with some of the images anyway, shall we? So um, yeah. uh, we've got quite a variety here. So um, you just tell me next when you want me to move on to the next slide and things, yeah. really. Talk about the images a little bit if you can. It'd be great. Yeah, I mean, my panel, any panel, has to be 20 images. And you, you hang this panel into a, in a gallery effect. And uh, the six or seven judges go in and they vote on it. And then it's a simple thumbs up, thumbs down, whether you passed or not. Um, this was a, all of my panel was done in black and white, um, and none of it was posed. Um, so this, this was just, it's an Italian wedding. It's quite unusual to have a sort of a makeup guy with, with looking like this, but I guess it kind of adds to the sort of character of the picture. Um, I've done quite a bit of work on the image, and it's part of my sort of signature, if you like, to you know, burn images around very heavily, but they're quite contrasty. Um, the back did blow out because it was so bright outside, but uh, it's just a, just a nice picture of the bride and bridesmaids getting ready. And one of the things I'm always trying to do is tell a story within one image. Next. Okay, again, um, you know, this is you know, thinking outside the box before the, the bride and groom or, or sorry, the bride and her dad walk down the aisle and or down down the the, the church um, path. And I saw them walking down, and I saw them walking in a formation because they'd spoken about it at the at the church gate, and it's quite a long uh, path. And I thought, you know what, it's going to be really dark inside um, the door. It's got I've got a lovely sky here. They're walking in line. Why don't I just step back and just get the view and I know it doesn't happen very often, you don't get this opportunity to do this type of shot, but I stood back and it now it's, it's just a lovely picture of and tells a story of bride going into to church to get married with all her bridesmaids, um, her sister's there and her dad's there, and it's, it tells a story in one image. Next. Uh I think the, uh, don't mind me chipping in there for a minute, Mark, um, I think it's one thing that so many photographers forget to show as well as the scene, isn't it? They're so involved with getting up close to the people, they're thinking it's all about the faces, but it's an, about the story, it's about placing them in that scene at that time. Uh, and, and this is the secret of documentary photography to some extent, is a wide angle lens or a wider angle approach to the image than just kind of just up close all the time with it. But um, lovely image that, sorry. Thank you. Next. I mean, you're absolutely right, Mark. It's about, um, you know, and this is a bit closer up, um, but, you know, to coin a phrase from a very famous photographer like Robert Capra, you know, if your pictures aren't good enough, you're not in close enough. And, you know, most of the time at a wedding, I'm using either a 20 millimeter lens or a 28 millimeter lens. Um, I don't own a lens longer than 135 mil. And I only use that 135 mil for, for speeches. I very rarely use a lens over 50 mil throughout the whole day. Uh, so I'm in. I'm always looking for, for little moments that happen. I love this image. One because it meets during the ceremony. Um, again, it was taken on quite a wide-angle lens, um, and I just love the fact that it looks like the little bridesmaid is, you know, granddad is showing little bridesmaid his speech for later or something that he's written down. And I kind of like the comic bit on the end, because his wife is sticking her tongue out. And <laughs> it's, it's kind of a little twist on it, um, but it's, it's a lovely image, I think. Next. OK, again, just caught the bride looking back up the church. Um, and it was just a grab shot. And uh, you know, it, it's. Although it is a grab shot, we, we're still very careful about the way we frame images um, and you know the lighting and just just making sure everything's right. And I can't control the lighting in this sort of scenario, but you know it's about framing it. And the reason this shot works is because of the shape of the window and, and the way the bride is in it. Uh, next, please. 
Okay. This about four years ago, I was fortunate to win um, William Photographer of the Year with Mario Asaboni through the MPA, and it's where you have to enter three prints from a wedding day, before the wedding, during the wedding, and after the wedding. And this is one of the three prints that um, won that award for me that year. And I was waiting for the typical shot of bride and dad walking down the aisle, and mum turned to look. And the light that was coming through the window just lit up her face through a hat. And again, I've never seen a, another mother of a bride wearing a hat like this and silhouetting her face, but it just made such an impact. And it doesn't matter that the bride and dad are out of focus. It's about mum looking, and you can see the emotion in her face looking at her daughter coming down to be given away. Next. Um, I'm not sure this picture was, should be in the panel, Mark. I think I made a mistake earlier. Uh, but it's a picture of a Jewish bride. We can, we can stay there a second. Um, it's a picture of a Jewish bride. It's posed. Um, I posed it very deliberately to take advantage of the light streaming through the window. But again, using my signature style of processing, you know, very heavy vignettes um, and sort of dark shadows. So next. Uh, this was um, another little trio of images I won Mario Saboni uh, Photographer of the Year with. And it was uh, my second um, Orthodox Jewish wedding. I do a lot of Jewish weddings. And I've done a lot of Jewish weddings before, but this was uh, my first or my second Orthodox. Uh, they're, they're called Lubavitch Jews, which is a, a strain of uh, Judaism. Um, they're very, very Orthodox. Um, they've actually become really good friends, um, the two people. The guy in the middle um, is, is the, uh, the, the groom's dad, and the groom is the guy in the middle with a little laughing on him. His name is Shruli. He married Gold on the day. And this is before the wedding took place. It's, it's called the Tish. And the Tish is where all the men meet before to, to pray. And also, of days gone by, that's when they would sort of negotiate and talk about the contract and make sure that the groom has got enough money to, to look after the bride. Um, I've darkened this heavily down. I mean, really, really heavy. Um, I mean, above the, the, the couple, above the the, the, um, the guys, there was a window light, which is why it's lit so lovely. But it didn't look right in the photograph, so I just painted it black and blacked it out, and um, the rest of the image sort of fell together then. Next. Again, this is uh, part of the panel. It's uh, part of a Jewish ceremony. Uh, it's called the bedecking, and it's where the, the groom comes in to take the veil off of the bride to make sure it's the, the right person that he's married. And this goes right back to the Old Testament. Um, and I'm not sure uh, who it was. It's, sort of like Abraham or something, and he had two daughters. He had an ugly daughter and a good-looking daughter. And apparently he switched them just before the, the ceremony because the bride normally wears a very heavy veil. And when the groom lifted the veil off, he realized he, he'd married the wrong girl. So nowadays the, the, the groom goes in and checks it's the right girl before he marries her. And this is just a lovely moment. You can come in and you can see the love on there between the two of them, and um, you can just see the, the emotion, but the two mums standing behind. Uh, again, just been vignetted heavily, just to make you focus on the bride and groom, but it's telling a story about what happens. Next. One Next. second. Sorry, Mark, I'm pressing the wrong button. Okay. This is um, the second image that went with the lady with the hat that you can just see in the background on the right hand side of the picture and we won a lot of awards with this image and it's about you know being in the right place at the right time um, making sure you're on the right side and then when something happens you know making sure that you get it and nail it. Um, it it works I think for many reasons I mean it works because you know it, it's all about her and I think it works because he, he's, he's got a darker skin, because it focuses on her. 
it works because the dark background is dark. It works because how often have we been at a wedding when the registrar says, you may kiss the bride, and what do they do? They go and do what they've been told. But this girl didn't. She just leapt back and just said, oh, my God, I'm married. And that was the look. And it sort of creates a nice heart shape. It's just a lovely image. And it's amazing how many couples we get saying, I want an image like that at my wedding. But, of course, they never will because it's a one-off. Next. Um, a lot of people say, did you pose this or did you call to the kids? No, I didn't. Um, and if I tell you the story, you'll understand it. It was uh, taken at a Christian wedding, and during the one of the uh, one of the breaks in the wedding, they had an opera singer at the back of the church. And most of us as adults wouldn't turn around to the church because it's not etiquette to do that. But the kids don't know about etiquette. So they just all turned round and they all looked, and because I was there at the back of, of the church, because that's the only place I could go in a, in a, a C of E church. And you can see you've got three kids there and one at the back just all looking round, and it's just a lovely little image. Next. Okay, again, this is a, a very, very orthodox wedding. Someone said to me, is is, is he a magician recently <laughs> because of the, of the cloth he's got in his hands? Yes, they did, Mark. And I said, no, no, that's the veil. And they said, well, she can't see through it. I said, but that's normal. In a, and it goes back to the little story I told earlier. This is very orthodox. And that bride wouldn't have seen any of her wedding. She would have been totally covered up. You know, the dresses these girls wear, they never show any of their arms. They're, they come up to their neckline. Um, and that's the veil. Um, and then afterwards, this couple never even held hands, and they had a chaperone sent with me to make sure I didn't make them hold hands to do the together photographs. Next. Excellent. Okay, so that kind of brings us uh, to some more questions for a minute. Uh, and even though we've got the question panel is lighting up here, <laughs> there's there's lots of things to actually chat lots about. To actually chat about. Sorry, Mark, I just feel Sorry, a little... No, no problem at all. I've got a bit of a, fee a feedback going on there. I'm not sure what that's from. I, I'm hearing you loud and clear. Okay. okay. I'm still getting I'm feedback. Still getting I'm, not feedback. Sure I'm not sure what it is. It sounds like it's coming it back, from, like your it's coming back from your computer. Really? I haven't moved at all. Um, Anybody else having... Anybody else that? having that? Can you hear that feedback? Hear that feedback? Sorry, guys. Sorry, guys. Anybody on the question panel? Yeah. Yeah. You haven't, um, you haven't uh, unspeakered there, unspeaker or, there or, or louded it? Or... No, I haven't touched anything. Are you on a headset at all? You on a headset at all, Mark? Yeah. Um, for some reason, uh, I think it's coming out of the, out of the computer, as well. computer as well. So, Mark, um, we've seen lots of images there for a minute. Let's kind of just uh, just get back into a little bit about you. Uh, you talked about being a chair, uh, the chairman as well of the London Portrait Group. Yes, um, I chaired the London Portrait Group for five years, um, and probably one of the best times in my photographic career. Um, I met some amazing people. Um, it all started off actually. Um, I I took it over, and we decided to get this guy over from Holland called Henk van Kooten, who we all know, a lot of us know very well now, and it suddenly became very apparent that we would not be able to fit it into our normal meeting place. So I went and met uh, the guys at Epsom UK, and they agreed to hold the, the event. And after the event, they just said, let's do this on a more regular basis. So I said, yep, yeah, fine. Well, I, don't, I can't fill it. I don't know any big photographers. And they said, don't worry. We'll open our books to all of our sponsored photographers to you. So I went and met them, um, and uh, on that list was a guy called Bob Carlos Clark. And I said, I'd love Bob to talk to, to the group, and um, they said, it's, it won't happen. And I said, well, please ask. I said, you know, we, we could ask. And I wrote an email, and it went to Bob's agent, a guy called Gile, and Gile sent it to Bob, and Bob sent it back, and it went to Epson, then back to me, and it went on for about four months like this, and one night I was sitting at home and the phone rang, 
and I picked it up and this softly spoken Irish accent said to me, is that Mark Seymour? And I said, uh, yes. And he said, have you got some time to talk to me? And I said, yeah, who is it? And he said, it's Bob Carlos Clark. And I said, of course. He said, Mark, he says, why didn't you just pick the phone up and call me? He said, you're a photographer, I'm a photographer, and we've got all these people, and he said a few swear words in between, that are keeping us apart. He said, we should be talking to each other, we're, we're doing the same stuff. And we spent about an hour just chatting on the phone, and it ended up with Bob inviting me over to his studio, and Bob uh, did a, a lovely seminar for us, and we became really, really good friends uh, after that. We, we used to see each other sort of about once every couple of weeks, go drinking. Uh, I could tell you many stories about things we did together at another time, but uh, it, it was a we had a great time. Um, and then Bob introduced me to a lot of other people because he had that network of friends. And after Bob spoke to us. Uh, he introduced me to a guy called Patrick Litchfield, Lord Patrick Litchfield, who, who was the Queen's cousin. And again, the same sort of thing happened. You know, I just said to Bob, "Is is this really going to happen with Patrick?" And he said, "Yes, of course it is." He said, "He said, give me ten minutes." He said, "I'll call you back." And he phoned me back, and he said, "Mark," he said, "Here's Patrick's phone number." He says, "Give him a call." I mean, it's quite daunting to sort of ring a member of the royal family. <laughs> on their mobile phone, but I did, and Patrick answered the phone, and I just, I didn't know what to call him, I just called him Sir, and he just said, oh, hi Mark, he says, I was expecting your call, and we had a phone, a lovely phone call about photography, and he invited me over to his studio, I had what can only be described as a red letter day, um, we just sat in his, his office, surrounded by some of the most famous prints in the world, from like Cartier Bresson and all those sorts of Salgado, all those sorts of people, and we just spoke about photography. And then to cap the day off, he took me out to lunch to his his private members club, and everyone had come up to him. He, he introduced me. He said, "This is Mark." He said, "Mark has got the ear of all the photographers in London." <laughs> of course, I said, "Patrick, you can't say that." He says, "Well, he says you're the chairman of the London Portrait Group." He says, "I'm coming to talk to you, aren't I?" Um, so we had some one, wonderful days, and you know, bless Bob. Bob um, passed away a few years ago, um, and I had the honour last year of photographing his uh, bereaved wife's new wedding, which was probably one of the highlights of my year last year because she phoned me up and she said, "Bob said you were a very good wedding photographer." She said, "I'd love you to photograph my wedding." She goes, "But there's three rules." She said, I don't want to ever see a picture in colour. I don't want any pose pictures at all on the day. And I don't want to talk to you the whole day. And to me, that was like a dream come true. That was my perfect wedding. Yeah, they're great, they're great people as well. And it was really sad when uh, Bob died and things really. But um, anyway, let's get up onto an up note. Let's, um, let's go through some images. So the next group of images we're going to be looking at uh, are the competition, some of the competition winners. So uh, let's come to start a quick look at that. Okay. These, all these, these pictures you're going to see, there's quite a few pictures here, so we're going to go through them really quickly. And these are all from this year's uh, Central Region Master Photographer of the Year, which is, is a great thing to go into to see if the year images are, are good enough for the sort of national competitions which come up in August. Um, this uh, was fortunate. This was in a category called Classic Weddings. There's three categories in the wedding category. There's classic, which is posed, documentary or contemporary, which is unposed, and portfolio, which you have to put in a portfolio of 10 images now from, from one wedding. Um, so this was classic, and this uh, got a merit on the evening. Um, this is the same bride. Um, it's a fantastic venue uh, called Cliveden, uh, which I do a lot of work at. and. Uh, this girl had the most fantastic wedding. She flew all of her guests over from Hong Kong. Um, the 60 guests, all 60 guests she treated to a, a wonderful meal at the at Heston Blumenthal's Fat Duck the night before. And this was her wedding day. And this, this image won um, 
classic wedding photographer of the year. Next. Um, this image, this was my favourite image of the evening actually and one I absolutely love and this was only taken about six or seven weeks ago and it's during the Tish and this stream of light comes through the windows and it just made a shape like a cross um, in the middle of the picture and it made the picture because if you take the cross out or the book out it's really not a very good, it, it doesn't stand up at all the image but that cross in the middle holds that whole image together and that comes second in the contemporary stroke documentary uh, category. Uh, the next category I'm going to just show you really quickly three of my entrants for uh, one wedding with ten images. Um, so if you just flick through them very quickly, this was a Jewish wedding, um, lovely light coming through the window, getting ready, again getting ready, this is all done on a 28mm lens, um, just I'm moving around, I shoot a lot from low angles, um, guys coming down the stairs, this was semi-posed this one. Next, um, this is this little triptych of three images that Mark is going to flick through, just make the wedding, I mean that guy, the look on his face when he saw, uh, just hold it there a second Mark, he saw his bride, um, there was another one but we cut it out, but, and then the look of sheer joy when he's there and the rabbi, so it holds it together, you know, if you took a couple there it maybe wouldn't be so strong but the rabbi there, you know it's a Jewish wedding, you know it's during the bedecking ceremony and yeah, it tells a story. Um, this uh, kind of tells a story from up above, we've shot it through one of the, uh, you know, one of the um, I just, it's railings, but it's significant because it's a Jewish wedding, it shows the chuppah and it's shot through a shape which is a Jewish star. Um, this is them afterwards and this is posed but I've just said just walk up and down the road. This is a picture of their ceremony, some of these ceremonies are just wow. Um, this is a picture of the two of them. Um, just stay on this image for a second Mark, just go back a second. A lot of my images, um, I'm very lucky, I have a, I always have an assistant with me on Jewish weddings and my assistant is a lighting man, he's not a second shooter, he's a lighting person and we use video, and th on this we were using tungsten light, so we had a little loud ID light and my assistant is lighting these images, uh, so that's why they're beautifully lit. And again, he's with me on the dance floor, he's lighting these images all the time and when I come on just in a few moments to talk about Nikon and one of my big things with Nikon is you know, with the D3S and the D4, this image was shot at 10,000 ISO, it allows me to shoot high ISO, fast shutter speeds like 200 to 250 a second, at F4, F5, get the image, get the detail, but if I put a flash on it, it would kill it and all that, those lovely colours in the background will be lost. Next wedding, just get a gulp of water a second. This wedding took place earlier this year, um, Linda, her name is, lovely bride, very animated um, and this is during the bedecking you're seeing now where she's reading sort of the Bible or the, the, the Old Testament. This is the groom, um, he works the, at this place, this is the, the ceremony, um, again just done with this little bit of video light popped on there, some very relaxed pictures of them afterwards, again just a lovely picture of the two of them afterwards and this is, just stay on this second mark, this is my killer image I think from, from the wedding. I really struggled at this wedding because the lighting was horrendous, they, they, you know, I was struggling to use the video light so I very rarely, and on this occasion it paid off, I, had, I went to flash and we used manual flash so we, we just set everything we can, but it's just beautiful the way the confetti is all around them. Any, uh, most of the times you know, would have had something over her face but I got lucky and she loves that image and it brought me so much kudos with her friends. Next. With, with those two panels you've seen, um, I was really lucky this year, we had some, some lovely weddings so let's uh, put in some strong work and we come, this, this image now, or this panel now I'm going to show you one uh, wedding photographer of the year for the documentary panel. The one you just saw 
came third and the other one got a merit. This is a Christian wedding, um, Marquis in the girls' in the girls' parents' garden, and just a typical English country wedding. Um, and again, I love this wedding because she wanted very little input from me. She wanted me to capture her day. Um, so I'm down there. I'm on this 28 mil lens again, just looking around for moments going on. Just stop on that image a second, Mark. Again, um, I love this. You know, I've got all my stuff, so I've got lots of keepers. I know that already, and I've just seen them standing outside the church door holding hands. So I've just thought, let's go in. It's going to tell a story. We know it's outside the church. They've just got married. Their guests are there. Here they are. We've taken them to a field because they've got no grounds at the house. Just did a couple of pictures of the two of them. And this is in their back garden, so it's very simple. And this is a great one of Dad, very animated, giving a speech. You're making me talk fast now, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> it's because you talked a lot at the beginning and we lost all that time. Guys, we're going to overrun a little bit because obviously we had that bit of technical um, it's issue. It's absolutely no problem at all, Mark. So, it's okay with you, Mark. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not rushing absolutely. at all. I apologize for those no. that you've got to kind of drop away. We've got loads of quick questions coming through the panel on equipment and techniques and everything else. We'll get to those, I promise you. Uh, it's just Mark's got some amazing images. I want to make sure that we get through that for the night and things ready, and then we'll share kind of the technical bit. Um, recently, you became one of the Nikon ambassadors. Uh, that's that's quite a big uh, medal on one's uh, chest, isn't it, really? Tell us a little bit about, about that. It is. Uh, I mean, it goes back to London Portrait Group, and um, I, I had a relationship with um, John McDonald at the time, and I was actually using Canon at the point. And um, you know, I didn't feel Nikon had the right gear at that point. They certainly didn't have any prime lenses, apart from the 28 millimeter 1.4. And John says, said to me, I'd "Love to get you on board." He says, "Let's do something with the London Portrait Group as well." And we worked out something where you know it was just a good deal for everyone, and they they fully supported the, the Portrait Group. And that was kind of the start of the relationship with Nikon. But it was, it was very loose. There was nothing in writing, um, and you know, I did the odd talk for them, and you know I got invited to the odd little product launch. But it, it was very loose, and you know sometimes I wouldn't hear from them for six months, and you know it, it, it was I, I liked the relationship because I wanted to be involved with Nikon, and but it was very loose. And then last year, um, Jenny called me, who's uh, one of the PR executives at Nikon, and she said. Mark said, I'd like you to shoot my wedding. Um, how do you feel about that? And I said, yeah. I said, do you want to do a deal and, and et cetera? And she said, no, no, no. She goes, nothing's doing me con. She goes, I love your work. I want you to be my photographer. So it's probably the wedding I felt the most pressure at ever because there were so many people there from Nikon who uh, there's a lot of amateur photographers there, a lot of people who know a lot about the technical side of the gear. And also, you know, I didn't know what was coming up with the ambassadorship, and you know, I wanted to impress these guys. And anyway, Jenny loved her pictures, and you know, the rest is sort of kind of history with with her wedding. This is Jenny then in the middle, Jenny, isn't it? Yeah, Jenny is the bride in the middle. Um, then in Jan, sorry, in February, I got a call from Jenny just to say um, my my boss would like to to meet you um, and have a meeting with you just to talk to you about the way things are going forward. And I just thought, oh, you know, have I done anything wrong, or have I let them down, or you know, perhaps they just want to end the relationship now, and they're just bringing me in to let me know about that. So I went in there, and it was quite clandestine. The meeting, you know, it was done at a restaurant in Oxford at 11 o'clock in the morning. They'd hired a suite there, and I went in, and we had a coffee and just a general chat about photography. And he said, well, he said the reason we called you, he said, we're changing a lot of things at Nikon. He said we're we we're, we're stopping all this sort of casual relationship thing and you know people just using our logo willy nilly and all this sort of thing. He said we're moving forward and we we're just going to be moving forward with five photographers, Mark. We and we've you know and they're in very specific genres. So you know we've got someone in the sports arena, we've got someone in the press arena because they're really big for us, and we've got someone in the the wildlife and I think that's Chris Packham. And they said, we'd really like you to be our ambassador for the wedding and social market. He said, how do you feel about that? And I said, 
oh, I'm gobsmacked. And I said, you know, it's a real, I, I'd love to do it for you guys. And that's how it came about. And they, they've given me a, I mean, I obviously I can't go into details, but it's a true sponsorship deal. Um, and I have a contract with them. Um, I'm not allowed to use any other gear ever, you know, while I have a contract, so I can't go and use a Fuji camera um, for my personal stuff. Um, I'm allowed to do anything outside of Nikon where Nikon can't supply that equipment. But it's it's um, it's a lovely relationship, and it's it's amazing. And since April, the amount of press and and kudos that has brought. I mean, we've had several magazines ring us up and just say we've been told to talk to you by Nikon because you're the person to talk to on this subject. And we get that probably about every two weeks now from magazines and you know, there's, there's quite a few sort of articles coming up in Professional Photography Magazine and some of the amateur stuff, um, amateur magazines over the next sort of few months. So that's how it come about and you know, we're looking forward to working with Ambassador, uh, sorry, with Nikon in the future. We've booked for SWPP for every day to do seminars there. So hopefully see a lot of you guys there come up and introduce yourself, have a chat, or just listen to what we've got to say. Cool. Let's um, have a look at some more images, shall we? So yep. um, you've chosen kind these of are, a, what, about another dozen to actually finish off on. Yeah. Um, these are just some of my favorite images, Mark, to be honest with you, um, I've taken over the years. Just go back to the previous one. We get, again, she's an orthodox girl. And you, for those that you don't shoot Jewish weddings, and she doesn't look that Jewish, but it's the dress that gives it away. You know, her sleeve, her arms are covered up. It's a very high neckline, and to be honest with you, it, it makes my job a lot easier because we don't have to worry about you know arms out on a show or you know plunging necklines or anything like inappropriate or not looking good. We never get that with Jewish girls. Secondly, she's absolutely beautiful. I mean, she looks very much like Audrey Hepburn, um, and she was. I mean, she's just a beautiful person in and out, and she was a joy to photograph. Um, in fact, I'm doing her brother's wedding in about six weeks' time. Is this natural light, or is this uh, um, additional yeah. lighting going on here? What have you got going on? It's natural light, but, but with a reflector. Okay. Next image. Color. Oh, my gosh. Um, yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is taken at the Savoy, um, and uh, you wouldn't believe the place if you saw it. It, it is a lot of sort of junk around it um, and these are panels that are stuck to the wall so you can just sort of see down from the candelabra there's a sort of line there where the retouching is not as perhaps good as it should be. Um, this was lit by uh, you know, my lighting guy so we've lit it with a video light. The great thing about doing this is that you know, with a video light or with a tungsten light is that you can look for uh, the, the Rembrandt lighting style lighting and you can make it look great and give that a wow factor to, 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 to all of your images. Um, this is one of, um, one of my sort of big, uh, biggest weddings last year. We were very lucky to, to photograph a wedding at the Royal Opera House in London. They only have two weddings there every year. And I photographed um, her friend's wedding. And it was a, a very, very English wedding. I mean, very understated. But obviously, all very public. You know, they're public school people, public school boys. Um, it was what I call a very upper class English wedding. And again, it just tells a story about the wedding day. Um, it's going back to using that wide angle lens. And here again, you know, you can see from where I am and from the angle of it. You know, I've got right in the car with them, but they're totally unaware of me. You know, it's, it's about how you approach things and. Um, We've got a great shot there of the bride and groom saying goodbye. I love this shot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I'd, you could write so many captions about that guy. You know, he's obviously a great character. Um, but I'm just looking for moments like that all the time. I love um, the little uh, image on the camera. I'm almost trying to see who it is, kind of thing with it on the little yeah, camera there. Yeah, it's uh, wicked that. If it was him, it would be even better. It would, it? it would be amazing with it. Yeah, and this is a lo another lovely moment. Um, just before the bride gets married, both parents normally say a prayer for them, and it's quite powerful in the way they do it. They don't just sort of place the hand loosely on the head. You can see there's a real power and depth and mean to what she's doing. 
I mean, this girl, I think she's only 17 or 18, and um, you know, a lot of the girls are that age when they get married. I mean, they're all most of her arranged marriages. She will have never held her boyfriend's hand at this point, even. Um, so yeah, the, you can see there's a lot of tension there. Uh, video wise, uh, sorry, light, lighting wise again, is it the your video guy? Is it just what's going on? It's just absolutely what's going on. I mean, like, you know, you've got a shadow there with the hand and all that sort of thing. I mean, there will be, you know, they, they place as much importance on video, the Jewish community. I mean, last weekend's wedding that we photographed was about 500 people at the Park Lane Hilton, and they had four videographers, and there was just me as a photographer with my lighting guy. <laughs> um, and it's kind of difficult sometimes, you know, getting the right angle so you don't get these people in all the time. Again, just a lovely moment. Quite a few people say, you know, do you realize her eyes are closed? But you know, she's, this is this Audrey Hepburn bride. I mean, she was a wonderful bride to photograph. You can't take a bad picture of her, really. But it's, you know, you, you know it's about the ceremony. This is the guy. Um, he's not the rabbi, the guy that sings the song and sings, uh, you know, does this, it's something called the seven Sheva Brockers, the prayers. And she's just, you can see she's totally in the moment about getting married. You know, she's, uh, you know, obviously a very orthodox girl. Um, this is, uh, you know, a, a big London wedding. Um, a lot of processing has been done to this image in Lightroom. Um, we, we exposed it for the bride and groom. Um, and then we've pulled out the background because it was just into the absolute darkness. Next, again, my Audrey Hepburn bride. Uh, nothing more to say on that one. She's beauty. Um, just looking for things around. You know, we were you know we're quite lucky because under this under this hooper or just outside this hooper, you know, everyone is stood there and you know, you you're very close up to people and. Again, this was done on a real wide-angle lens, and I was probably, I stuck the camera about, I don't know, three inches from his face. Probably could see me, probably wondered what the hell was going on. Again, this, I love things like little kids in the pictures. She's, you can see she's inquisitive, just maybe thinking, you know, one day this will be me. One of my favorite images from last year, could tell a big story around this, but these five girls aren't sisters. The two People who got married both got um, both lost their partners tragically. They met at a bereaved club, and they both one had two daughters and one had three daughters, and they got married at Cliveden. And the daughters just all got together, and this wasn't posed. They just went down on the lawn and were just playing around like this for hours. I just sat on the lawn and just clicked away, and this was the best of the bunch. Again, another picture from the same wedding. You know, it's it's a lovely stately home, and it had these old library steps that, and this girl loves reading, and she just got up there and you know started reading, and it just forms a lovely shape to the picture, and again, and a lovely moment that story tells about the wedding. I just love where the da uh, the Daily Mail, the newspaper down at the bottom there. There's the one reading yeah. the old, and the one reading the yeah. new. It's you couldn't get any more documentary than that, really, could, no, could you? No. The, the characters and, you know, and the lines and the cross the ages going across all that. I think it's uh, mm, great. Uh, you know, a lot of photographers would have just gone in and they'd got a long lens and taken a picture of the of the girl reading the book, but that doesn't tell a story because it could just be a little portrait that anyone would take then, and there's nothing that hangs it all together, but you know, it's a nice triangular shape, and you're right, the books, um, again, it's storytelling. This is, this is something that happens a lot of Jewish weddings, you know, a Jewish wedding, it's all about the bride, the bride stays on the dance floor the whole night, all the guests stay on the dance floor the whole night, it's not like a Christian wedding where, you know, they wait till they get drunk before they go up and dance, and it, this always makes a great shot, they get hold of the bride's dress, we are lighting this with a video light. The lighting at these events is awful. There's blue lights, orange lights, red lights flashing, and you can see like the bride's dress, you know, where we've tried to correct the bride's face as, as there's some more horrible colours on there. But it kind of doesn't matter because it's about the bride and it's about the impact and it's storytelling with her friends all around her. So you can kind of get away with those flaws in the background because it's about the bride and about a story. I suppose one of the good the good things about having lots of video people around as well is that they're bringing more tungsten light to the scene, isn't it? Cleaning things up for you. That they are, yeah. 
again, this is another thing that happens at a lot of weddings. They call it a snake, where the, all the grooms and men and ushers um, hold hands, and the groom jumps along, and they throw him up. And again, the great advantage of, of shooting with a video light is that you're not waiting for this flash to recharge, and you're not banging a flash in their eyes. So I, I do stick it on a high speed for something like this, and I probably shoot in 10 frames a second because uh, you know at 200 a second. I'm not going to be able to capture that moment, you know, just as it happens. It's going to be in there somewhere, and there's going to be some, you know, bad images either side. But in the middle, there's going to be that real gem, which that is. It's beautifully framed. Um, that again, that was done on a 20 millimeter lens. Again, just a typical scene scene of a of a Jewish wedding. Again, telling the story. See all the ladies on the left, all the guys on the right. Um, the bride and groom there with the rabbi, and I've gone behind and used the trees as, as part of the frame. And then we've got um, the last but not least shot, isn't it? Is this wonderful shot of the yeah. uh, rabbis here? Wonderful. We, um, yeah, it was taken at the same one as the, as the previous wedding, but at a different part of the wedding day. And, you know, if it had just been six or seven of us standing around having a chat, it wouldn't look anything, and it's it's the way they are. It's their beards, it's their hats, it's their coats. It's almost like a uniform. And the fact that you know Jewish men, as we know, they're very animated with their hands. You know, they're always just skating with them, and um, it, it's just a lovely image. And we that image and sorry, this image and the other one, we 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 sell in a couple of art galleries. There's a gallery in Kansas that sells it in a very um, in a in a big Jewish community. And we had a gallery take some of our work in Mayfair um, a couple of years ago, and they sold it. And we have agreement with it that, that, that with the synagogue that you know any money we make from it, 50% uh, of the profits after the gallery's taken their cut, we give to the synagogue. Um, but it's the, the gallery owner. Uh, he looked at it and he just said it's very like very in the style of Caravaggio. Yeah, and, very. And I haven't heard of I haven't heard of Caravaggio at that style, or really not really taken much notice of his work. And he said, you know, Caravaggio painted Christians. He said, but go and look at it. And he said, if you could get a whole series of things like that, he said, it would be wonderful for an exhibition. But of course, you can't because you'd then be setting them up. And um, but yeah, we get a lot of comments on that. Um, and. We give a cut. We give. We printed it, and we gave it to the rabbi for the, the synagogue. And you know, they know me now. So when I go in there, you know, the, the rabbis give me a kiss on both cheeks, and they welcome me in. And you know, I'm almost like I'm accepted as one of them. Excellent, Mark. Absolutely brilliant, mate. Thanks for share, uh, sharing that. Loads, loads of questions. Let's get going. Just before we do. Um, Mark's just got onto face, uh, to Facebook now, so if you haven't liked him or his photography already, uh, to get to his face, Facebook page, it's uh, facebook.com uh, forward slash Mark Seymour Photography. Uh, that's M-A-R-K-S-E-Y-M-O-U-R Photography. And just go and like his page there and so on. Don't, ha don't hound him to death. He's a busy working photographer. Fingers crossed if I uh, twist his arm enough, he'll uh, allow us to come out on a few weddings with him for next year for the Photographer Academy and actually see behind the scenes and so on. Right, let's go right back to the beginning. Let's have a look at some questions. Um, so what main lenses do you use during the shoot and what do you favor uh, as far as aperture-wise? Um, my favorite lens is it's a lens that's no longer made anymore, and it was one of the reasons, that, that, or one of the things that was swayed me to go back to Nikon. It's a 28 millimeter f1.4 lens. Uh, you can buy it; it's, you, you'd have to go onto eBay. But the nearest equivalent now is the 24 mil f1.4. Um, that's my favorite lens, without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, normally, I use two. I've got two D4 bodies, uh, and I have a 28 mil on one and a 50 millimeter on the other. Aperture, I don't have a favorite aperture. I shoot what is required, and sometimes it's f1.4. Um, a lot of times it's f4. Great. Um, how, what's the ratio between the stage formal shots and the natural spontaneous images on a normal wedding? Okay. Um, I will at groups. Um, on, a, on a Christian wedding, we limit groups to four. Uh, we might go to six if they push us. I mean, tomorrow's wedding, we've got five groups. Jewish weddings, 
you know they're, they're a law amongst themselves and you know unfortunately we do have to do groups I mean last week's wedding there was one group of 58 people so we went there early set the lights up uh, and got on with the rest of the stuff and they have over 20 groups and that's part they are they allow a specific time for that group photography typically I would say um, posing bride and grooms uh, with with their sort of beautiful portraiture 10 minutes or so groups 10 minutes that's probably it on the day Jewish sure. weddings we allow that hour period uh, which which we are given the bride and groom never go to the reception at a Jewish wedding they always expect to do the family shots and then probably 15 minutes with the two of them okay um, the shot that was the um the photograph of the uh, bride and the groom dancing and there were all the confetti in the air. You said that you used flash on that, was it? Yes. Yep. Okay. Just to confirm that, sorry. Uh, what was your worst moment um, whilst on a real job and what lessons did you learn from it? <laughs> I could give you a dozen now. <laughs> Cheers, mate. <laughs> <laughs> it's not me who's asking the questions, honestly. <laughs> I, 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 I would tell the truth, actually. I actually forgot to turn up to a wedding. Um, and it was at one of my one of the venues that I've got an extremely good relationship, and I got a phone call to say, "Mark, where are you?" And for some unknown reason, I, it got it got missed off the wall planner or something. And he just said, "Don't worry." He says, "I'll give him a story." He says, "He says how long you could be?" And I says, "I could be there in half an hour." He says, "We'll delay the whole ceremony half hour for you, Mark." Wow, that's the way to do it. <laughs> so the lessons to be learned on that. <laughs> um, turn up early. Look at your diary. <laughs> um, are the I, I have a lot more. Yeah, I'm a lot more. I mean, I even have um, now. I I have a checklist of stuff because on a Jewish wedding, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, I have two wheelie cases that I take with me because you know I back up and back up again, and I need to take studio lights for the groups and you know the the LED lights for the dance floor, and I need two cameras and. I've got five or six lenses in there and then backups. So we take a lot of stuff. So I have a checklist that I go through to make sure everything is there. Cool. Uh, let me, so I just lost my question list there. Sorry. Um, uh, film or digital? So when did you give up film and when, and when did you move to digital? I was one of the early converters. Um, when I, I mean, when I started weddings um, professionally and I worked with National Weddings and then I worked, um, if you like, part-time until I was uh, you know, made redundant because I probably wasn't doing my job properly. And then I became a full-time wedding photographer and I think that was, I mean, my first digital camera was a Fuji S1. Um, so that's the point which I turned digital. And believe me, when I look back at the files now, they're not, they don't look good. <laughs> Uh, no, I mean it's it's weird. I haven't shot film now since two thousand and one, and it still sure. frightens me to death. I had some reprints done from some original files the other day, and I looked at it and thought, "Oh my god!" Um, perhaps because I jumped no one, a bit too no soon. One shoot raw. We never. Sh no one shoot raw back then, did they? I shot raw. Yeah, we, oh, did you? Yeah, but I used to run micro drives instead of compact flash, because compact oh, okay. flash was uh, two hundred and fifty six meg of compact flash was seven hundred and eighty pounds, whereas a gigabyte of two hundred uh, was two hundred and twenty pounds. So uh, I remember the micro drives yet, yeah, because they weren't that safe either. Though. Well, touching wood, I never had any trouble except when I dropped no. one in, in in the sea during a wedding once. But it's all different <laughs> thing. It's not about me today. It's about you, Mark. Um, great. Can you ask Mark about his black and white conversion technique? Well, yeah, I use SilverFX. I use SilverFX Pro, and um, I've I've basically got my own um, what do you call it? Like a um, help me, Mark. What's the word? Um, I've got my own little presets action. kind of thing. Is it that you've made yourself? Yeah, yeah. And I've got a couple of. Pre I've probably got two presets that I use for nearly ninety percent of my work, and then after that. I'm into sort of heavily burning it down, dodging it. Um, I don't use any standard ones. I don't use any, um, you know, film presets. Um, that's that's all I can say really. I mean, I've developed my own. Um, we are running some our own sort of one-on-one -on -one seminars later. If you want to find out more, I guess come and come and talk to me.
Yeah, I've sent, I've sent the links on the Facebook page. Um, so anyway, they can kind of keep up to date with what you've got going on there and things, really. So uh, I've sent that out to everybody so that she'll be able to link and go and like your Facebook anyway. Um, you mentioned about some of the awards and competitions. Um, which, uh, which organization are you a member of? Um, I'm a member of the MPA, which is the Master Photographer Association. <laughs> Excuse me. Are you back? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can now. Oh, sorry. I, I cough, so excuse me, everyone. Um, I'm a member of the Master Photographer Association, um, and I've been a member um, ever since they would let me join. I mean, they wouldn't let me join initially because I was, wasn't was a full-time photographer, and you have to be a full-time photographer, um, earning, I think, 80 or 90% of your income to join the MPA. Um, I'm also a member of the SWPP. Um, and that's it. Great. Um, loads and loads of people saying just what f fantastic images and everything else. So very well done on that. Um, when did you give up medium for uh, medium format? Um, really, when I bought the the, the Fuji S1, we went pretty much straight over to digital. Um, I still do shoot a little bit of film now and again. I mean, you know, I do have other cameras here. And you know, I do like to shoot a bit of film. And up until probably six months ago, I was I I, I shot on some Leicas and that sort of thing. But um, you know, I, I've got a Nikon FM3 here I bought, so I can sort of continue the brand. And uh, I've not really sort of got around to using it yet. But uh, I, I I do hanker back for it. And it's like the old LPs. You know, I'd like to go and buy a a, a nice record deck and listen listen to some LPs. But the fact of it is. <laughs> I don't have the time to start doing all that processing and and then I just want to see the image and I want to get it off my desk and I want to give the best service that I can for, for my clients. Good. What mode are you in? Are you in man, uh, man, manual mode, aperture priority? What's your kind of standard setup? Everything is manual. I, I don't use aperture. I don't use um, uh, TV or whatever it's called. Don't use any of those. It's absolutely manual the whole time. Um, even my flash is manual the whole time. Do you ever think about auto ISO nowadays? Never. Because if you're using auto ISO, um, it, it's, you're bringing an unknown into it because it's, gonna, it, it's just going to shove the ISO up or down. And, and it's, I mean, I'm not really sure how it works, to be honest with you, Mark. My, my camera was set on it and I freaked because Nikon sent me a camera to sort of test and it was on it and I sort of thought, oh my God. And, Thankfully, the guy who works with me, uh, with my lighting guide, he said, "Oh, he said, I, he said I had that problem. He said I know what it was, and we sorted it out." But no, everything is manual, and it, it's kind of go back to the old days, really. You know, when we I used to use, and I still do have a light meter, and quite often I'll just walk past the bride and just flick it and set it from that. Or when you're doing it every day, or you you get to know it. Um, you can kind of get a good idea of what the, the, the settings are, and because we've got the histogram now, we can look at the back. So it's manual all the way, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> um, and pretty, uh, pretty much most of everything that you've seen, except where we're in, we're inside, is natural light. So that's your preference, yeah? Uh, yeah. I mean, I prefer to use that. I'm not adverse to using flash, and I wouldn't say don't use flash or I never use flash because. There are times when you have to use flash or you need flash. I mean, when I do my groups, I always use flash because you know it's not about a moment; it's just a record shot, and I want to make sure that the eyes are nice and clean. Um, when I'm doing my documentary stuff, very, very rarely do I use flash. I mean, it's, yeah, it it doesn't happen. Um, when when I'm doing bride and groom shots, particularly on a Jewish wedding. We do use a reflector, so we are using a, you know, we're, we're cleaning up the, the eyes there, but uh, it's done a lot more naturally than with, with flash. I try and steer away from it. But if I do use it, I use it on manual again because, you know, I can't, can control it. In fact, just the only point I do use flash on a wedding is when I'm doing the, during the speeches, and I do some scene setting, which is like, you know, the whole table or the, the person doing the speech with all the all of the wedding in the background, and I do a lot of close-ups, and that's where I use my 135 mil um, of people laughing or reactionary shots. 
and I do use the flash, I bounce it up on the ceiling and one of the great things about using manual flash with a zoom, with a fixed lens is that with a fixed lens, you know, if you want to fill that person in the frame, you've always got to be roughly the same distance from whoever you're photographing. So if you set your flash to manual, it's always going to be there or thereabouts. If you use a zoom lens and zoom in and out, it's going to be all over the place because you know you've got to vary the power to going out on your manual flash. What's the best metering mode for a wedding? So do you use, yeah, do you, do you meter in a min camera or a hand, a hand meter or what do you do? I, I, I do both. I mean, I do have, I still use um, my sort of Minolta meter um, that is very, very tatty these days. Um, and I think I just dropped on it on the last question. You know, I quite often will, you know, when I'm doing the groups, I'll go and take a, a meter reading because you know it's right then. And I'm a great believer in, you know, get it right in camera, and it saves so much time in processing. I think, you know, a lot of people um, think that let's let's sort it out in Photoshop, or you know, we we've got two stops either way. So, you know, I don't think like that. I want to get it pretty much right, and most of my exposures are probably within about a third or half a stop. Um, you know, when I'm documenting a wedding, when we're doing the when we've metered it, it's pretty much spot on all the time. Um, I've heard a lot about the Nikon 105 and 135 DC lenses. Can you explain about them? Is that from Mr. Lawrence? Oh, it is. Oh, sorry, I didn't see it. Is that good or bad? <laughs> no, I just because he he borrowed my lenses the other week, and um, they're very two. They're two really underrated lenses. Um, they they've got this um, defocus control, which um, it, even a lot of, not a lot of people at Nikon know how to use it, and they're not sold in big volumes. These lenses because they're they're quite old style lenses, um, but they are absolutely fabulous. I mean, you know, they're not the fastest lenses focusing wise, but you know, go on any any review site, 105 mil f2, 135 f2.8, and you'll you'll just see there. Everyone says the king of portrait lenses, you know, the king of out of focus or bokeh. You know, they are beautiful, beautiful lenses, and you know, a lot of people now use the 70 to 210. Um, I'm kind of, I just think it's, I never feel comfortable with that lens. It's too big. I feel like I've got a missile on the end of my camera, and I'm going about to shoot someone. Um, whereas 135 mil is probably about sort of five inches long, I guess, at the maximum, and it's f2.8. Is cool. that okay, Mr. Lawrence? <laughs> <laughs> if I'd stolen his name, I would have ignored him anyway. <laughs> um, okay, do you use image hosting at all? Do you sell your images online? We do. We use SmugMug. Oh, excellent. Um, and you know, I'd, I'd recommend anyone who is a professional photographer, it's a no-brainer to use SmugMug. Even if you're not selling images, it's a black backup. It, they give you... Um, as much cloud space as you want, and it's about 150 quid a year, is it? Oh, it's silly money. This is the brand new Smug Mug in front of you now. We're doing a, a special webinar tomorrow, kind of getting you going with the un unveiling. Um, and when you look at the uh, the amount of different designs, and you can kind of click and drag and drop and everything else. So whether you're a Smug Mug user or not, uh, join me. I've sent out the link already. Join me online uh, tomorrow night along with Sean Rogan. Um, but thanks, I didn't know you were smug, smug mug, so yeah. it was a very good No, plug, I've been a smug mug, mug uh, and you know, I, I get a lot, of that, that support is really good, I, I get support from Alistair Jolly, yep. um, and you know, it's really good, you, you can't knock it at all, um, it's a no-brainer for me. So far as selling images, you know, it's not like the old days, we don't sell a lot online, um, we get the occasional order come through and it's a bonus. But predominantly, it's, it's for hosting to show the bride and groom their images. Great. And then the last question I've got, because uh, we're ex excellent. This is we're coming to it. Uh, what advice would you give to somebody starting out in the world of wedding photography, as a photographer and as a business? Okay, it's it's a lot harder than anyone thinks. Number one, um, it, it, it's it is a business. Um, and it, you've got to be number one passionate about photography, but 
you've got to be you've got to have a good business head on you any business whatever you choose whether it be you know photographing brides running a portrait studio or selling anything you can think of whether you open a garage you know selling cars or whether you you do a shoe shop selling it's all about marketing having a great web presence and being you know a great business person because you you could be the best photographer in the world but if you don't attract the clients and you don't once you attract them give them a brilliant customer service um, you 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 know you won't be around for long it used to be a lot easier you know in the old days you know there wasn't there weren't as many photographers you know, and mark will probably um, back this up you know he was probably the only photographer in his village or in his town now there's probably half a dozen and it's the same where i live near windsor you know there's hundreds of photographers locally and you know everyone's trying to compete and give a lower price and more for it and it staggers me sometimes how you know if you actually done a business plan how you how, how they go out f for such a cheap price you'd probably earn more money you go and stack in shelves on Sainsbury's. So the other thing is, you know, write a good business plan and charge accordingly, and you know, stick with it. And and find your style, isn't it? You know, be a, a you know, play around, yeah. have have a bit of fun with it. You know, so many. I totally agree with you. Yeah, it's just you know, it can get a little bit boring at times if you don't kind of play, especially at the beginning and things. Really, uh, guys, if I you haven't got style. So, sorry, sorry. I was just to say, I think the style thing. I mean, you know, I, I'd say my style didn't develop really until. You know, a lot later in my career, and you know, I was more focused in doing weddings and being almost like a job in wedding photography, and just doing a good job and giving great service. Whereas now, and you, know, every, you should all try and do this. Is like Mark said, is um, get a style and develop it so that you know, when, when a girl looks at my images or my website or when another, they know it's done like Mark Seymour and you know there's there's other photographers, you know, people like Gordon McGowan. You may love his style or you may loathe his style, but you can look at one of his images and you say, that's Gordon's picture. And the same goes with artists, you know, you can go to a gallery and you know, if, if you like Turner for example, you can walk in a gallery and you can see it's all Turner's work because there is a style to it. And I guess that's 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 the thing we should all be trying to um, achieve. Uh, brilliant. So uh, if there's no more questions for the night, thank you very, very much, Mark, for everything that you've done, uh, done with us. Fingers crossed we'll get you back again to talk about some of your street, your street photography because that is documentary that. as well, and that's amazing. And um, fingers crossed if I twist his arm enough, perhaps he'll jump on board with us and become one of our top togs next year, and perhaps we can get behind the scenes shooting some documentary style of weddings just to see how the man works and thing, things really. Mark, is there any one thing that you want to finish off off with anything you'd like to talk about? Anything you want to plug? Um, not really. I just, I mean, first of all, um, you know, I'd just like to say thank you very much uh, for everyone for their attention. It's kind of difficult because, you know, I don't know how who's out there or who I'm talking to. Um, but uh, I really appreciate you all um, coming in tonight. And uh, feel free to you know connect with me on Facebook or you know, we we do. You know, if you do email us, we try and answer the questions. We're not really you know, I can't answer technical questions about Nikon because, you know, I don't know the technical side about their cameras. If, if some people want to ask that, um, but feel free to connect about photography or images and that sort of thing. Um, we are doing our own sort of uh, you know wedding seminars, and if you are interested, okay, just just go onto my website and uh, you know send me a message. You know, put, you know, keep me informed when your um, seminars are coming up, and uh, we'll email you all accordingly. But uh, just thank you very much. It's really, really appreciated um, for, for all uh, tuning in tonight. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Mark. Every day or you, you get to know it, um, you can kind of get a good idea of what the, the, the settings are. And because we've got the histogram now, we can look at the back. So. It's manual all the way, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> um, and pretty, uh, pretty much most of everything that you've seen, except where we're in, uh, we're inside, is natural light. So that's your preference, yeah? Uh, yeah. I mean, I prefer to use that. I'm not adverse to using flash, and I wouldn't say don't use flash or I never use flash because there are times when you have to use flash or you need flash. I mean, when I do my groups, I always use flash because 
you know, it's not about a moment, it's just a record shot and I want to make sure that the eyes are nice and clean. Um, when I'm doing my documentary stuff, very, very rarely do I use flash. I mean, it's, yeah, it, it doesn't happen. Um, when, when I'm doing bride and groom shots, particularly on a Jewish wedding, we do use a reflector, so we are using a, you know, we're, we're cleaning up the, the eyes there, but uh, it's done a lot more naturally than with, with flash. I try and steer away from it. If I do use it, I use it on manual again because, you know, I can't can control it. In fact, just the only point I do use flash on a wedding is when I'm doing the during the speeches, and I do some scene setting, which is like you know the whole table or the the, the person doing the speech with all the all of the wedding in the background. And I do a lot of close ups, and that's where I use my 135 mil um, of people laughing or reactionary shots. And I do use the flash. I bounce it up on the ceiling. And one of the great things about using manual flash with a zoom, with a fixed lens, is that with a fixed lens, you know, if you want to fill that person in the frame, you've always got to be roughly the same distance from whoever you're photographing. So if you set your flash to manual, it's always going to be there or thereabouts. If you use a zoom lens and zoom in and out, it's going to be all over the place because, you know, you, you've got to vary the power to going out on your manual flash. What's the best metering mode for a wedding? So do best you use, yeah, do you, do you meter in a min camera or a hand, a hand meter or what do you do? I, I, I do both. I mean, I do have, I still use um, my sort of Minolta meter um, that is very, very tatty these days. Um, and I think I just dropped on it on the last question, you know, I quite often will, you know, when I'm doing the groups, I'll go and take a, bit, a meter reading because you know it's right then and I'm a great believer in, you know, get it right in camera and it saves so much time in processing. I think, you know, a lot of people um, think that let's, let's sort it out in Photoshop or, you know, we, we've got two stops either way. So, you know, I don't think like that. I want to get it pretty much right and September, October, November, I thought, well, I'll start taking the inquiries and we booked a few people and I did a lot sort of uh, you know by the seat of my pants but I was confident that it would come off and that was the real the start of my wedding uh, photographer career. Well, brilliant. I mean, for those of you who don't know what uh, national weddings are, they they were uh, a, obviously a national company that basically booked weddings all over Britain, and they had uh, jobbing photographers who just turn up, shoot the job, and then actually give them the roles of film, and that was it. So, sorry for those who are just kind of catching up with us now. Um, Mark, before uh, before we go on, I'm just going to ask you in a minute for some kind of funny tales, perhaps, before we start to show some of your images. And if this is the first time with you on a webinar, please, guys, remember that uh, you are going to be seeing some images in a minute. This is just giving lots of time for people to kind of join us live and things. So a little bit of an introduction before Mark shows uh, some of his amazing photography. So any kind of funny stories about couples or anything else before we get going? Yeah. The, the, I mean, I've, I've got lots of stories to tell about National Williams because we were dealing with, you know, the low end of the market and, um, you know, I was going into people's homes pretty much unannounced. Um, you know, they, they were booking calls, so they, they were expecting someone to come around, but you know, it was a very loose appointment. And you were going in effectively like a double glazing sales guy with, with an album of everyone else's photographs in, in, in a horrible velour crush velvet album. But one story sticks out above them all is that I knocked on this um, this door in a not very desire, a desirable part of uh, Felton in Middlesex and um, knocked on the door and Dad answered the door in a, a string vest and he said, who are you, mate? And I said, uh, I'm Mark Seymour. I said, I've worked for National Weddings. I've just come to see your daughter about photography. And I've gone into the lounge, and um, when I've walked in the lounge, I've, I've sat down, and the, the whole family are there. And it's almost like a scene from, I don't know, Coronation Street, or, you know, it, it, it's, it's looked pretty seedy in this lounge, it's, you know. It's dirty in there, it's grimy, and it, it's quite kind of sort of pressurised as well because I'm out of, my, out of my comfort zone. So in this lounge, there's the TV in one corner, there's the bride and groom, there's mum and dad. 
mum and dad both smoking away heavily. And then lying in the corner is, is the bride's sister and her boyfriend. And they're literally getting it together in, in the corner. Uh, and I mean getting it together. You know, they were quite heavy at it in the lounge while I'm doing my presentation. Um, which is verbatim because you say the same thing on every. You know, I, I get a lot. Of that their support is really good. I, I get support from Alistair Jolly. Yep. Um, and you know, it's really good. You you can't knock it at all. Um, it's a no-brainer for me. So far as selling images, you know, it's not like the old days. We don't sell a lot online. Um, we get the occasional order come through, and it's a bonus. But predominantly, it's it's for hosting to show the bride and groom their images. Great, and then the last question I've got, because uh, we're ex excellent, this is, we're coming to it. Uh, what advice would you give to somebody starting out in the world of wedding photography as a photographer and as a business? Okay, it's, it's a lot harder than anyone thinks, number one. Um, it, it's, it is a business, um, and it, you've got to be number one passionate about photography. But you've got to be, you've got to have a good business head on you. Any business, whatever you choose, whether it be you know, photographing brides, running a portrait studio, or selling anything you can think of, whether you open a garage, you know, selling cars, or whether you, you do a shoe shop selling, it's all about marketing, having a great web presence, and being you know, a great business person because. You, you could be the best photographer in the world, but if you don't attract the clients and you don't, once you attract them, give them a brilliant customer service, um, you, 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 know, you won't be around for long. It used to be a lot easier, you know, in the old days, you know, there, wasn't, there weren't as many photographers, you know, and Mark will probably um, back this up, you know, he was probably the only photographer in his village or in his town. Now there's probably half a dozen, and it's the same where I live, near Windsor, you know, there's hundreds of photographers locally and you know everyone's trying to compete and give a lower price and more for it and it staggers me sometimes how you know if you actually done a business plan how you how, how they go out f for such a cheap price you'd probably earn more money you go and stacking shelves on Sainsbury's so the other thing is you know write a good business plan and charge accordingly and you know stick with it and and find your style, isn't it? You know, be a, a you know play around, yeah. have have a bit of fun with it. You know, so many. I totally agree with you. Yeah, it's just you know it can get a little bit boring at times if you don't kind of play, especially at the beginning and things. Really, uh, guys, if I you haven't the got style, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I was say, I think the style thing. I mean, you know, I, I'd say my style didn't develop really until you know a lot later in my career, and you know, I was more focused in doing weddings and being almost like a job in wedding photography and just doing a good job and giving great service. Whereas now, and you, know, every, you should all try and do this, is like Mark said, is um, get a style and develop it so that... You just to uh, watch us. Well, welcome, to, uh, welcome to anyone who's uh, around the world, so good, good to have you all on board. Great. So we're, we're going to be having a quick chat about your life and kind of your work and everything else. We've got lots and lots of photographs to be uh, looking at, Mark. Uh, what are we expecting during the course of the night? What are you going to be showing um, us? I'm going to be showing you um, my documentary style wedding photography, uh, mostly in black and white, um, that just lets me sort of capture, if you like, the, sort of the essence of, of a wedding day. Um, so please sort of fire away with, uh, with lots of questions. Cool. We've got them coming in thick and fast already, so you don't need to uh, <laughs> um, prompt it. I'll be prompting during the course of the night anyway. Uh, we'll give you out Mark's um, Facebook page towards the end and so on. Remember, he's a busy working photographer, so don't hound him. Otherwise, you won't have any life at all kind of thing with it. So, uh, um, okay, let's, let's get into a little bit about you, Mark. Uh, tell us uh, how you first got into photography and how you ended up getting into wedding photography. Okay. Um, it started uh, way, way back in uh, 1986. Um, I can remember the year because I just got married. And uh, like a lot of um, young couples, we were short of cash. And, and I was a photographer at the point, And um, I was really an amateur photographer. And I've been one since really I was sort of four or five years old. I was always playing around with cameras. Um, but I don't know why. 
Um, that day I went into the newspaper shop and I bought a um, the Telegraph newspaper, which I never buy and I probably haven't bought many times since. But in the back in the job pages, as, as you know Thursday is uh, job day advertising in the Telegraph, there was a tiny little advert at the back that said sell wedding photography. So it just caught my eye. I wasn't looking for a wedding photography job, it just caught my eye. It's a good way of earning some extra money and I applied to, um, to, to the company and um, went up there, saw them and uh, they agreed to train me in the art of selling wedding photography. Uh, the company is called National Weddings, uh, who later went on to become Kodak Weddings. Uh, they really were a, a huge, huge company back in the 70s and 80s and employing something like 300 photographers every weekend. Um, it was a very high pressure job, it was purely sales, you used to go out in the evening, um, see three appointments, if I sold I earned money, if I didn't sell I didn't earn money. And that continued for probably sort of, I don't know, five or six months and I approached the sales director and I said, hey, I, you know, I'd love to learn wedding photography, I think I'm a good photographer. And he rebuffed me totally and just said, Mark, he says, everyone support from Alistair Jolly. Yep. Um, and, you know, it's really good. You, you can't knock it at all. Um, it's a no-brainer for me. So far as selling images, you know, it's not like the old days. We don't sell a lot online. Um, we get the occasional order come through and it's a bonus. But predominantly, it's, it's for hosting to show the bride and groom their images. Great, and then the last question I've got, because uh, we're ex excellent this is, we're coming to it. Uh, what advice would you give to somebody starting out in the world of wedding photography as a photographer and as a business? Okay, it's, it's a lot harder than anyone thinks, number one. Um, it, it's, it is a business, um, and it, you've got to be number one passionate about photography. But you've got to be, you've got to have a good business head on you. Any business, whatever you choose, whether it be you know, photographing brides, running a portrait studio, or selling anything you can think of, whether you open a garage, you know, selling cars, or whether you you do a shoe shop, selling. It's all about marketing, having a great web presence, and being you know a great business person because. You, you could be the best photographer in the world, but if you don't attract the clients and you don't, once you attract them, give them a brilliant customer service, um, you, 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 know, you won't be around for long. It used to be a lot easier, you know, in the old days, you know, there, wasn't, there weren't as many photographers, you know, and Mark will probably um, back this up, you know, he was probably the only photographer in his village or in his town. Now there's probably half a dozen, and it's the same where I live, near Windsor, you know, there's hundreds of photographers locally and you know everyone's try to compete and give a lower price and more for it and it staggers me sometimes how you know if you actually done a business plan how you how, how they go out f for such a cheap price you'd probably earn more money you go and stacking shelves on Sainsbury's so the other thing is you know write a good business plan and charge accordingly and you know stick with it and and find your style, isn't it? You know, be a, a you know play around, yeah. have have a bit of fun with it. You know, so many. I totally agree with you. Yeah, it's just you know it can get a little bit boring at times if you don't kind of play, especially at the beginning and things. Really, uh, guys, if I you haven't got style. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I, was say, I think the style thing. I mean, you know, I, I'd say my style didn't develop really until you know a lot later in my career, and you know, I was more focused in doing weddings and being almost like a job in wedding photographer and just doing a good job and giving great service. Whereas now, and you, know, every, you should all try and do this, is like Mark said, is um, get a style and develop it so that you know, when, when a girl looks at my images or my web, 10 minutes or so, groups, 10 minutes, that's probably it on the day. Jewish sure. weddings, we allow that hour period. Uh, which which we are given. The bride and groom never go to the reception at a Jewish wedding. They always expect to do the family shots and then probably 15 minutes with the two of them. Okay, um, the shot that was the um, the photograph of the uh, bride and the groom dancing and there were all the confetti in the air. You said that you used flash on that, was it? Yes. Yep. 
Okay, just to confirm that, sorry. Uh, what was your worst moment um, whilst on a real job, and what lessons did you learn from it? <laughs> I could give you a dozen now. <laughs> Cheers, mate. <laughs> <laughs> it's not me who's asking the questions, honestly. <laughs> I, 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 I will tell the truth, actually. I actually forgot to turn up to a wedding. Um, and it was at one of, my, one of the venues that I've got an extremely good relationship. And I got a phone call to say, Mark, where are you? And for some unknown reason, I, it, got, it got missed off the wall planner or something. And he just said, don't worry. He says, I'll give him a story. He says, he says how long you could be? And I says, I could be there in half an hour. And he says, we'll delay the whole ceremony half hour for you, Mark. Wow, that's the way to do it. So the lessons to be learnt on that? <laughs> um, turn up early, look at your diary. <laughs> um, are the I, I am a lot more, yeah, I'm a lot more, I mean, I even have, um, now I, I have a checklist of stuff, because on a Jewish wedding there's a lot of stuff. I mean, I have two wheelie cases that I take with me because... You know, I back up and back up again, and I need to take studio lights for the groups, and you know, the, the LED lights for the dance floor, and I need two cameras, and I've got five or six lenses in there, and then backups. So we take a lot of stuff. So I have a checklist that I go through to make sure everything is there. Cool. Uh, let me. So I just lost my question list there. Sorry. Um, uh, film or digital? So when did you give up film, and when and when did you move to digital? I was one of the early converters. Um, when I, I mean, when I started weddings um, professionally, and I worked with national weddings, and then I worked, um, if you like, part time until I was uh, you know, made redundant because I probably wasn't doing my job properly. And then I became a full time wedding photographer, and I think that was, I mean, my first digital camera was a Fuji S1. Um, so that's the point which I turned digital. And believe me, when I look back at the files now, they're not, they don't look good. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, it's, it's weird. I haven't shot film now since 2001, and it still sure. frightens me to death. I had some real film presets. Um, that's, that's all I can say, really. I mean, I've developed my own. Um, we are running some of our own sort of one-on-one -on -one seminars later. If you want to find out more, I guess come and, come and talk to me. Yeah, I've sent, I've sent the links on the Facebook page, um, so anyway, they can kind of keep up to date with what you've got going on there and things, really, so uh, I've sent that out to everybody, so they should be able to link and go and like your Facebook anyway. Um, you mentioned about some of the awards and competitions. Um, which, uh, which organization are you a member of? Um, I'm a member of the MPA, which is the Master Photographer Association. Excuse me. Are you back? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can now. Oh, sorry. I, I cough, so excuse me, everyone. Um, I'm a member of the Master Photographer Association, um, and I've been a member um, ever since they would let me join. I mean, they wouldn't let me join initially because I was, wasn't was a full-time photographer, and you have to be a full-time photographer, um, earning, I think, 80 or 90% of your income to join the MPA. Um, I'm also a member of the SWPP. Um, and that's it. Great. Um, loads and loads of people saying just what f fantastic images and everything else. So very well done on that. Um, when did you give up medium for uh, medium format? Um, really, when I bought the, the the Fuji S1, we went pretty much straight over to digital. Um, I still do shoot a little bit of film now and again. I mean, you know, I do have other cameras here. And you know, I do like to shoot a bit of film. And up until probably six months ago, I was I I, I was shot on some Leicas and that sort of thing. But um, you know, I, I've got a Nikon FM3 here I bought, so I can sort of continue the brand. And uh, I've not really sort of got around to using it yet. But uh, I, I I do hanker back for it. And it's like the old LPs. You know, I'd like to go and buy a a, a nice record deck and listen to, listen to some LPs. But the fact of it is. <laughs> I don't have the time to start doing all that processing and and then I just want to see the image and I want to get it off my desk and I want to give the best service that I can for, for my clients. Good. What mode are you in? Are you in man, uh, man, manual mode, aperture priority? What's your kind of standard setup? 
everything is manual. I, I don't use aperture, I don't use um, uh, TV or whatever it's called, don't use any of those, it's absolutely manual the whole time. Um, even my flash is manual the whole time. Do you ever think about auto ISO nowadays? Never. Because if you're using auto ISO, um, it, it's you're bringing an unknown into it because it's gonna, it's just gonna shove the ISO up five groups. Jewish weddings, you know, they're, they're a law amongst themselves, and you know, unfortunately, we do have to do groups. I mean, last week's wedding, there was one group of 58 people. So we went there early, set the lights up, uh, and got on with the rest of the stuff. And they have over 20 groups. And that's part, they, are, they allow a specific time for that group photography. Typically, I would say um, posing bride and grooms uh, with, with their sort of beautiful portraiture, 10 minutes or so, groups, 10 minutes, that's probably it on the day. Jewish sure. weddings, we allow that hour period, uh, which, which we are given. The bride and groom never go to the reception at a Jewish wedding. They always expect to do the family shots and then probably 15 minutes with the two of them. Okay, um, the shot that was the um, the photograph of the uh, bride and the groom dancing and there were all the confetti in the air, you said that you used flash on that, was it? Yes. Yep, okay, just to confirm that, sorry. Uh, what was your worst moment um, whilst on a real job and what lessons did you learn from it? <laughs> I could give you a dozen now. <laughs> Cheers, mate. <laughs> <laughs> it's not me who's asking the questions, honestly. <laughs> I, I, I will tell the truth, actually. I actually forgot to turn up to a wedding. Um, and it was at one of, my, one of the venues that I've got an extremely good relationship. And I got a phone call to say, Mark, where are you? And for some unknown reason, I, it, got, it got missed off the wall planner or something. And he just said, don't worry. He says, I'll give him a story. He says, he says how long you could be? And I says, I could be there in half an hour. He says, we'll delay the whole ceremony half hour for you, Mark. Wow, that's the way to do it. So the lessons to be learnt on that? <laughs> um, turn up early, look at your diary. <laughs> um, are the I, I am a lot more, yeah, I'm a lot more, I mean, I even have, um, now I, I have a checklist of stuff, because on a Jewish wedding there's a lot of stuff. I mean, I have two wheelie cases that I take with me because... You know, I back up and back up again, and I need to take studio lights for the groups, and you know, the, the LED lights for the dance floor, and I need two cameras, and I've got five or six lenses in there, and then backups. So we take a lot of stuff. So I have a checklist that I go through to make sure everything is there. Cool. Uh, let me. So I just lost my question list there. Sorry. Um, uh, film or digital? So when did you give up film, and when and when did you move to digital? I was one of the early converters. Um, when I, I mean, when I started weddings um, professionally, and I worked with national weddings, and then I worked, um, if you like, part time until I was in the world. But if you don't attract the clients, and you don't once you attract them, give them a brilliant customer service, um, you, you you know you won't be around for long. It used to be a lot easier. You know, in the old days, you know, there was there weren't as many photographers, you know, and Mark will probably um, back this up, you know, he was probably the only photographer in his village or in his town. Now there's probably half a dozen, and it's the same where I live near Windsor, you know, there's hundreds of photographers locally, and, you know, everyone's trying to compete and give a lower price and more for it, and it staggers me sometimes how, you know, if you actually done a business plan, how you, how, how they go out for such a cheap price, you'd probably earn more money if you go and stack in shelves on Sainsbury's. So the other thing is, you know, write a good business plan and charge accordingly and, you know, stick with it. And, and find your style, isn't it? You know, be a, a, a you know, play around, yeah. have, have a bit of fun with it, you know, so many. I totally it's kind, agree with you. Yeah, it's just, you know, it can get a little bit boring at times if you don't kind of play, especially at the beginning and things really. Uh, guys, if I you haven't got. Style, so, sorry, sorry, I was just going to say, I think the style thing, I mean, you know, I, I'd say my style didn't develop really until, you know, a lot later in my career and, you know, I was more focused in doing weddings and being almost like a job in wedding photography and just doing a good job and giving great service. Whereas now, and you, know, every, you should all try and do this, is 
like Mark said, is um, get a style and develop it so that you know, when a girl looks at my images or my website or when another, they know it's done like Mark Seymour. And you know, there's there's other photographers, you know, people like Gordon McGowan. You may love his style or you may loathe his style, but you can look at one of his images and you say, that's Gordon's picture. And the same goes with artists. You know, you can go to a gallery and you know, if you like Turner, for example, you can walk in a gallery and you can see it's all Turner's work because there is a style to it. And I guess that's 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 the thing we should all be trying to um, achieve. Uh, brilliant. So uh, if there's no more questions for the night, thank you very, very much, Mark, for everything that you've done, uh, done with us. Fingers crossed we'll get you back again to talk about some of your street, your street photography because that is documentary that. as well, and that's amazing. And um, fingers crossed if I twist his arm enough, perhaps he'll jump on board with us and become one of our top togs next year, and perhaps we can get behind the scenes shooting some documentary style of weddings just to see how the man works and thing, things really. Mark, is there any one thing that you want to finish off off with anything you'd like to talk about? Anything you want to plug? Um, not really. I just, I mean, first of all, um, you know, I'd just like to say thank you very much uh, for everyone for their attention. It's kind of difficult because, you know, I don't know how who's out there or who I'm talking to. Um, but uh, I really appreciate you all um, coming in tonight. And uh, feel free to you know connect with me on Facebook or you know, we we do. You know, I didn't feel Nikon had the right gear at that point. They certainly didn't have any prime lenses apart from the 28 millimeter 1.4. And John has said to me, love to get you on board. He says, let's do something with the London Portrait Group as well. And we worked out something where you know, it was just a good deal for everyone. And they, they fully supported the, the Portrait Group. And that was kind of the start of the relationship with Nikon. But it was, it was very loose. There was nothing in writing. Um, and you know, I did the odd talk for them. And you know, I got invited to the odd product launch, but it, it was very loose. And you know, sometimes I wouldn't hear from them for six months. And you know, it, it, it was I, I liked the relationship because I wanted to be involved with Nikon, and but it was very loose. And then last year, um, Jenny called me, who's uh, one of the PR executives at Nikon, and she said, "Mark, she said, I'd like you to shoot my wedding. Um, How do you feel about that?" And I said, "Yeah." I said, "Do you want to do a deal?" And and etc. And she said, no, no, no. She goes, nothing's doing me con. She goes, I love your work. I want you to be my photographer. So it's probably the wedding I felt the most pressure at ever because there were so many people there from Nikon who uh, there's a lot of amateur photographers there, a lot of people who know a lot about the technical side of the gear. And also, you know, I didn't know what was coming up with the ambassadorship and, you know, I wanted to impress these guys and Anyway, Jenny loved her pictures, and you know, the rest is sort of kind of history with with her wedding. This is Jenny then in the middle, Jenny, isn't it? Yeah, Jenny is the bride in the middle. Um, then in Jan, sorry, in February, I got a call from Jenny just to say um, my my boss would like to to meet you um, and have a meeting with you just to talk to you about the way things are going forward. And I just thought, oh, you know, have I done anything wrong, or have I let them down, or? You know, perhaps they just want to end the relationship now and they're just bringing me in to let me know about that. So I went in there and it was quite clandestine, the meeting. You know, it was done at a restaurant in Oxford at 11 o'clock in the morning. They'd hired a suite there. And I went in and we had a coffee and just a general chat about photography. And he said, well, he said the reason we called you, he said, we're changing a lot of things at Nikon. And he said, we're, we're, we're stopping all this sort of casual relationship thing and you know, people just using our logo willy-nilly and all this sort of thing. He said, well, we're moving forward. We, we're just going to be moving forward with five photographers, Mark. We, and, we've, you know, and they're in very specific genres. So you know, we've got someone in the sports arena. We've got someone in the press arena because they're really big for us. And we've got someone in the, the wildlife. And I think that's Chris Packham. And they said, we'd really like you to be our ambassador for the wedding and social market. He said, how do you feel about that? And I said, well, I'm gobsmacked. And I said, you know, it's a real, I, I'd, um, I'm a member of the MPA, which is the Master Photographer Association. <laughs> Excuse me. Are you back? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can now. Oh, sorry, I, I cough, so excuse me, everyone. Um, I'm a member of the Master Photographer Association, um, and I've been a member um, 
ever since they would let me join. I mean, they wouldn't let me join initially because I was wasn't a full time photographer, and you have to be a full time photographer, um, earning I think eighty or ninety percent of your income to join the MPA. Um, I'm also a member of the SWPP, um, and that's it. Great. Um, loads and loads of people saying just what f fantastic images and everything else. So very well done on that. Um, when did you give up medium for uh, medium format? Um, really, when I bought the the, the Fuji S1, we went pretty much straight over to digital. Um, I still do shoot a little bit of film now and again. I mean, you know, I do have other cameras here, and you know, I do like to shoot a bit of film. And up until probably six months ago, I was I I, I shot on some Leicas and that sort of thing. But um, you know, I, I've got a Nikon FM3 here I bought, so I can sort of continue the brand and. Uh, but I've not really sort of got around to using it yet, but uh, I, I, I do hanker back for it. And it's like the old LPs, you know. I'd like to go and buy a, a, a nice record deck and listen, listen to some LPs. But the fact of it is, I don't have the time to start doing all that processing, and and then I just want to see the image and I want to get it off my desk and I want to give the best service that I can for, for my clients. Good. What mode are you in? Are you in man, uh, man, manual mode, aperture priority? What's your kind of standard setup? Everything is manual. I, I don't use aperture. I don't use um, uh, TV or whatever it's called. Don't use any of those. It's absolutely manual the whole time. Um, even my flash is manual the whole time. Do you ever think about auto ISO nowadays? Never. Because if you're using auto ISO, um, it's you're bringing an unknown into it because it's gonna it's just gonna shove the ISO up or down and and it's I mean, I'm not really sure how it works to be honest with you Mark my, my camera was set on it and I freaked and because Nikon sent me a camera to sort of test and it was on it and I sort of thought oh my god and thankfully the guy who works with me uh, with my lighting guide just said oh he said I he said I had that problem he said I know what it was and we sorted it out but no everything is manual and it, it's kind of go back to the old days really you know when we I used to use and I still do have a light meter and quite often I'll just walk past the bride and just flick it and set it from that or come about and you know we're looking forward to working with ambassador uh, sorry with Nikon in the future we've booked for SWPP for every day to do seminars there so hopefully see a lot of you guys there come up and introduce yourself have a chat or just listen to what we've got to say cool let's um, have a look at some more images shall we so yep. um, you've chosen kind these of are, a, what about another dozen to actually finish off on? Yeah, um, these are just some of my favourite images, Mark. To be honest with you, um, I, I've taken over the years. Just go back to the previous one. We get again. She's an orthodox girl, and you, for those that you don't shoot Jewish weddings, and you know, she doesn't look that Jewish, but it's the dress that gives it away. You know, her sleeve, her arms are covered up. It's a very high neckline, and to be honest with you. It makes my job a lot easier because we don't have to worry about, you know, arms out on a show or, you know, plunging necklines or anything like inappropriate or not looking good. We never get that with Jewish girls. Secondly, she's absolutely beautiful. I mean, she looks very much like Audrey Hepburn, um, and she was. I mean, she's just a beautiful person in and out, and she was a joy to photograph. Um, in fact, I'm doing her brother's wedding in about six weeks' time. Is this natural light, or is this uh, um, additional yeah. lighting going on here? What have you got going? It's on? natural light, but, but with a reflector. Okay. Next image. Color. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. <laughs> this is this is taken at the Savoy, um, and uh, you wouldn't believe the place if you saw it. it. It is a lot of sort of junk around it, um, and these are panels that are stuck to the wall, so you can just sort of see down from the candelabra there's a sort of line there where the retouching is not as perhaps good as it should be. Um, this was lit by uh, you know, my lighting guy so we've lit it with a video light. The great thing about doing this is that you know, with a video light or with a tungsten light is that you can look for uh, the, the Rembrandt lighting style lighting and you can make it look great and give that wow factor to, 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 to all of your images. Um, this is one of um, one of my sort of big uh, biggest weddings last year. We, we were very lucky to, to photograph a wedding at the Royal Opera House in London. They only have two weddings there every year, 
and I photographed um, her friend's wedding, and it was a, a very, very English wedding. I mean, very understated, but obviously all very public. You know, they're public school people, public school boys. Um, it was what I call a very upper class English wedding. And again, it just tells a story about the wedding day. Um, it's going back to using that wide angle lens. And here again, you, know, you can see uh, from where I am and from the angle of it, you know, I've got right in the car with them, but they're totally unaware of me. You know, it's, it's about how you... There's a tiny little advert at the back that said, sell wedding photography. So it just caught my eye. I wasn't looking for a wedding photography job. It just caught my eye. It's a good way of earning some extra money. And I applied to, um, to, to the company and um, went up there, saw them, and uh, they agreed to train me in the art of selling wedding photography. Uh, the company was called National Weddings, uh, who later went on to become Kodak Weddings. Uh, they really were a, a huge, huge company back in the... 70s and 80s, I and mean, employing something like 300 photographers every weekend. Um, it was a very high pressure job. It was purely sales. I used to go out in the evening, um, see three appointments. If I sold, I earned money. If I didn't sell, I didn't earn money. And that continued for probably sort of, I don't know, five or six months. And I approached the sales director and I said, hey, I, you know, I'd love to learn wedding photography, I think I'm a good photographer. And he rebuffed me totally and just said, Mark, he says, everyone wants to be a wedding photographer. Even back in 86, everyone wanted to be a wedding photographer. And he said, if you really want to be one, he said, you need the right gear. And asked me what gear I had, and he said, you need to go and get a medium format camera, a Metz flash gun, and a light meter. So I went and bought that, and then he said, go and shoot 10 rolls of film. Now, as an amateur, 10 rolls of film is quite a, a task to go and shoot when you don't have subjects or you're not doing it for, for paid money. And also, it's, it's very expensive to go and get 10 rolls processed. But I did it, took them back. He liked them. They agreed to train me. And in a nutshell, that, that year in the April, when the wedding season started, they took me out. I went out six times with one of their photographers, and he phoned me up the following week and said, the colleague you've been going out with is sick. You're doing the wedding yourself this weekend. So I had six lessons with a photographer, and then I was uh, put in the deep end, and it really was sort of bicycle clips around the bottom of the trouser time. Very, very hard, but I think my enthusiasm sort of... Uh, carried me through. And I stayed with National Weddings for about a year. And I decided this was going to be my career. Um, I'm a great believer in that you know, when a door opens, go through it, and opportunities will come your way. And the next thing I did is I went and borrowed £4,000 from mum and dad and took out an advert in Yellow Pages, having not shot a wedding at this point, saying, Mark Seymour Photography. In fact, I tell a lie. I actually called myself Classic Weddings at that. Photographers, Mark, we, we've, you know, and they're in very specific genres. So, you know, we've got someone in the sports arena, we've got someone in the press arena because they're really big for us, and we've got someone in the, the wildlife. And I think that's Chris Packham. And they said we'd really like you to be our ambassador for the wedding and social market. He said, "How do you feel about that?" And I said. <laughs> I'm gobsmacked, and I said, you know, it's a real, I, I'd love to do it for you guys, and that's how it came about, and they, they've given me a, I mean, I, obviously, I can't go into details, but it's a true sponsorship deal, um, and I have a contract with them, um, I'm not allowed to use any other gear ever, you know, while I have a contract, so I can't go and use a Fuji camera um, for my personal stuff. Um, I'm allowed to do anything outside of Nikon where Nikon can't supply that equipment, but it's it's um, it's a lovely relationship and it's it's amazing. And since April, the amount of press and and kudos that has brought. I mean, we've had several magazines ring us up and just say we've been told to talk to you by Nikon because you're the person to talk to on this subject, and we get that probably about every two weeks now from magazines and. There's, there's quite a few sort of articles coming up in Professional Photography Magazine and 
some of the amateur stuff, um, amateur magazines over the next sort of few months. So that's how it come about, and you know, we're looking forward to working with Ambassador, uh, sorry, with Nikon in the future. We've booked for SWPP for every day to do seminars there. So hopefully, see a lot of you guys there. Come up and introduce yourself, have a chat, or just listen to what we've got to say. Cool. Let's um, have a look at some more images, shall we? So yep. um, you've chosen kind these of a, what about another dozen to actually finish off on? Yeah. Um, these are just some of my favourite images, Mark. To be honest with you, um, oh, I've taken over the years. Just go back to the previous one. We get again. She's an Orthodox girl, and you, for those that you don't shoot Jewish weddings, and you know, she doesn't look that Jewish, but it's the dress that gives it away. You know, her sleeve, her arms are covered up. It's a very high neckline, and to be honest with you, it, it makes my job a lot easier because we don't have to worry about you know arms out on a show or you know plunging necklines or anything like inappropriate or not looking good. We never get that with Jewish girls. Secondly, she's absolutely beautiful. I mean, she looks very much like Audrey Hepburn, um, and she was. I mean, she's a beautiful person in and out, and she was a joy to photograph. Um, in fact, I'm doing her brother's wedding in about six weeks' time. Is this natural light, or is this uh, um, additional yeah. lighting going on here? What have you got going? It's on? natural light, but with a reflector. Okay. Next image. Color. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. <laughs> this is this is taken at the Savoy. Uh, to the picture. Um, I've done quite a bit of work on the image, and it's part of my sort of signature, if you like, to you know, burn images around very heavily, but they're quite contrasty. Um, the back did blow out because it was so bright outside, but uh, it's just a, just a nice picture of the bride and bridesmaids getting ready. And one of the things I'm always trying to do is tell a story within one image. Next. Okay, again, um, you know, this is you know, thinking outside the box before the, the bride and groom or, or sorry, the bride and her dad walk down the aisle and or down down the the, the church um, path. And I saw them walking down, and I saw them walking in a formation because they'd spoken about it at the at the church gate, and it's quite a long uh, path. And I thought, you know what, it's going to be really dark inside um, the door. It's got I've got a lovely sky here. They're walking in line. Why don't I just step back and just get the view and I know it doesn't happen very often, you don't get this opportunity to do this type of shot, but I stood back and it now it's, it's just a lovely picture of and tells a story of bride going into to church to get married with all her bridesmaids, um, her sister's there and her dad's there, and it's, it tells a story in one image. Next. Uh I think the, uh, if you don't mind me chipping in there for a minute, Mark, um, I think it's one thing that so many photographers forget to show as well as the scene, isn't it? They're so involved with getting up close to the people, they're thinking it's all about the faces, but it's an, about the story, it's about placing them in that scene at that time. Uh, and, and this is the secret of documentary photography to some extent, is a wide angle lens or a wider angle approach to the image than just kind of just up close all the time with it. But um, lovely image that, sorry. Thank you. Next. I mean, you're absolutely right, Mark. It's about, um, you know, and this is a bit closer up, um, but, you know, to coin a phrase from a very famous photographer like Robert Capra, you know, if your pictures aren't good enough, you're not in close enough. And, you know, most of the time at a wedding, I'm using either a 20 millimeter lens or a 28 millimeter lens. Um, I don't own a lens longer than 135 mil. And I only use that 135 mil for, for speeches. I very rarely use a lens over 50 mil throughout the whole day. Uh, so I'm in. I'm always looking for, for little moments that happen. I love this image. One because it meets during the ceremony. Um, again, it was taken on quite a wide-angle lens, um, and I just love the fact that it looks like the little bridesmaid is, you know, granddad is showing little bridesmaid his speech for later. Or something that he's written down, and I kind of like the comic bit on the end because his wife is sticking her tongue out, and <laughs> it's, it's kind of. Little, but I was confident that it would come off, and that was the real the start of my wedding uh, photographer career. 
Well, brilliant. I mean, for those of you who don't know what uh, national weddings are, they, they were uh, a, obviously a national company that basically booked weddings all over Britain, and they had uh, job-in photographers who just turn up, shoot the job, and then actually give them the roles of film, and that was it. So sorry for those who are just kind of catching up with us now. Um, Mark, before, uh, before we go on, I'm just going to ask you in a minute for some kind of funny tales, perhaps, before we start to show some of your images. And if this is the first time with you on a webinar, please, guys, remember that uh, you are going to be seeing some images in a minute. This is just giving lots of time for people to kind of join us live and things. So a little bit of an introduction before Mark shows uh, some of his amazing photography. So any kind of funny stories about couples or anything else before we get going? Yeah. The, the, I mean, I've, I've got lots of stories to tell about National Williams because we were dealing with you know, the low end of the market and um, you know, I was going into people's homes pretty much unannounced. Um, you know, they, they were booking calls, so they, they were expecting someone to come around, but you know, it was a very loose appointment. You were going in effectively like a double glazing sales guy with, with an album of everyone else's photographs in, in, in a horrible velour crushed velvet album. But one story sticks out above them all is that I knocked on this um, this door in a not very desire, a desirable part of uh, Felton in Middlesex and um, knocked on the door and Dad answered the door in a, a string vest. And he said, who are you, mate? And I said, uh, I'm Mark Seymour. I said, I've worked for National Weddings. I've just come to see your daughter about photography. And I've gone into the lounge. And um, when I've walked in the lounge, I've, I've sat down. And the, the whole family are there. And it's almost like a scene from, I don't know, Coronation Street. or you know, it, it, it's, it looks pretty seedy in this lounge, it's, you know. It's dirty in there, it's grimy, and it, it's quite kind of sort of pressurised as well because I'm out of, my, out of my comfort zone. So in this lounge, there's the TV in one corner, there's the bride and groom, there's mum and dad, mum and dad both smoking away heavily, and then lying in the corner is, is the bride's sister and her boyfriend, and they're literally getting it together in the corner. Uh, and I mean getting it together, you know, they were quite heavy at it in the lounge while I'm doing my presentation, um, which is verbatim because you say the same thing on every, every sort of the show. And uh, <laughs> I, I give this presentation and the guys, uh, halfway through the presentation, this cat walks across the floor. And when I say, but in the back of the job pages, as, as you know, Thursday is uh, job day advertising in the Telegraph, there was a tiny little advert at the back that said, sell wedding photography. So it just caught my eye. I wasn't looking for a wedding photography job. It just caught my eye. It's a good way of earning some extra money. And I applied to um, to, to the company and um, went up there, saw them, and uh, they agreed to train me in the art of selling wedding photography. The company was called National Weddings, uh, who later went on to become Kodak Weddings. Uh, they really were a, a huge, huge company back in the 70s and 80s, and employing something like 300 photographers every weekend. Um, it was a very high-pressure job. It was purely sales. We used to go out in the evening, um, see three appointments. If I sold, I earned money. If I didn't sell, I didn't earn money. And that continued for probably sort of, I don't know, five or six months. And I approached the sales director and I said, hey, I, you know, I'd love to learn wedding photography. I think I'm a good photographer. And he rebuffed me totally and just said, Mark, he says, everyone wants to be a wedding photographer. Even back in 86, everyone wanted to be a wedding photographer. And he said, if you really want to be one, he said, you need the right gear. And asked me what gear I had. And he said, you need to go and get a medium format camera, a Metz flash gun, and a light meter. So I went and bought that, and then he said, go and shoot 10 rolls of film. Now, as an amateur, 10 rolls of film is quite a, a task to go and shoot when you don't have subjects or you're not doing it for, for paid money. And also, it's, it's very expensive to go and get 10 rolls processed. But I did it, took them back. He liked them. They agreed to train me. And in a nutshell, that, that year in the April when the wedding season started, they took me out. 
I went out six times with one of their photographers and he phoned me up the following week and said, the colleague you've been going out with is off sick, you're doing the wedding yourself this weekend. So I had six lessons with a photographer and then I was uh, put in the deep end and it really was sort of bicycle clips around the bottom of the trouser time. Very, very hard, but, but I think my enthusiasm sort of uh, carried me through. And I stayed with National Weddings for about a year and I decided this was going to be my career. Um, I'm a great believer in that you know, when a door opens, go through it and opportunities will come your way. And the next thing I did is I went and borrowed four thousand pounds from mum and dad and took out an advert in yellow pages. Having not shine, why don't I just step back and just get the view and I know it doesn't happen very often, you don't get this opportunity to do this type of shot, but I stood back and it now it's it's just a lovely picture of and tells a story of bride going into to church to get married with all her bridesmaids, um, her sisters there and her dad's there and it's it's tells a story in one image. Next. I think the, uh, if you don't mind me chipping in there for a minute, Mark, um, I think it's one thing that so many photographers forget to show as well as the scene, isn't it? They're so involved with getting up close to the people, they're thinking it's all about the faces, but it's an, about the story, it's about placing them in that scene at that time. Uh, and, and this is the secret of documentary photography to some extent, is a wide angle lens or a wider angle approach to the image than just kind of mm. just up close all the time with it. But um, lovely image that, sorry. Thank you. Next. I mean, you're absolutely right, Mark. It's about, um, you know, and this is a bit closer up, um, but, you know, to coin a phrase from a very famous photographer like Robert Capra, you know, if your pictures aren't good enough, you're not in close enough. And, you know, most of the time at a wedding, I'm using either a 20mm lens or a 28mm lens. Um, I don't own a lens longer than 135mm. And I only use that 135 mil for the speeches. I very rarely use a lens over 50 mil throughout the whole day. Uh, so I'm in. I'm always looking for, for little moments that are happening. I love this image. One because it meets during the ceremony. Um, again, it was taken on quite a wide-angle lens, um, and I just love the fact that it looks like the little bridesmaid is, you know, granddad is showing little bridesmaid his speech for later or something that he's written down. And I kind of like the comic bit on the end because his wife is sticking her tongue out and <laughs> it's, it's kind of a little twist on it, um, but it's it's a lovely image, I think. Next. Okay, again, just caught the bride looking back up the church um, and it was just a grab shot and, uh, you know, it's... Although it is a grab shot, we, we're still very careful about the way we frame images um, and you know the lighting and just just making sure everything's right. And I can't control the lighting in this sort of scenario, but you know it's about framing it. And the reason this shot works is because of the shape of the window and, and the way the bride is in it. Uh, next, please. Okay. This. About four years ago, I was fortunate to win um, Wedding Photographer of the Year with Mario Asaboni through the MPA. And it's where you have to enter three prints from a wedding day, before the wedding, during the wedding, and 